Good morning. I am Mr. Endo, an international cooperation officer in the Fire and Disaster Management Agency of Japan. I'll be moderating the International Forum on Fire and Disaster Management today. For today's webinars, we have prepared a simultaneous interpretation in several languages. Please select the language of your choice. Then, we will now begin the International Forum on Fire and Disaster Management. First of all, Mr. Ogisawa, Director General of the Civil Protection and Disaster Management Department, will make an opening speech. Please start. Good morning. I am Mr. Ogisawa, Director General of the Civil Protection and Disaster Management Department in FDMA. Today, for this International Forum on Fire and Disaster Management, we are joined by more than 1,000 people from about 60 countries and regions. Thank you very much. I would also like to thank UNDRR, JICA, the Yoko Fire Department of Yokohama City, and the Firefighting and Disaster Prevention Related Companies for your cooperation and participation in this forum. Japan has been hit by natural disasters, such as earthquakes, storms, and floods many times in the past. Firefighting agencies have experienced many rescue cases, not only in responding to fires, but also in dealing with these disasters. Through these events, we have gained lots of knowledge and experiences, and in order to share them with many countries, we have been holding the International Firefighting Forum since 2007. So far, the forum has been held 11 times in nine countries. This time, in light of the global outbreak of the new coronavirus, we decided to switch to an online forum. Taking advantage of the online format, we would like to share our knowledge and experiences not only with specific countries and regions, but also with a wide range of people. For such reason, simultaneous interpretation will be provided in 11 languages and at six different time slots. We have prepared three topics for this year's forum. Rescue operation, volunteer firefighters and the planning and certification system for firefighting equipment. The first topic is the rescue operations. The most advanced rescue skills in Japan are owned by the Yokohama Fire Department. We will have a report on the Yokohama Fire Department experience of rescue operations in a train accident. Under a very difficult situation, how did they operate their unit? We believe that this presentation will provide various insight into the mindset, safety management, and other aspects of the situation. The next topic is volunteer firefighters. As the supporters of professional firefighters, how do volunteer firefighters in Japan work in their communities? Some examples will be presented. As disasters became more severe and diverse, Japan is entering a phase where professionals alone cannot respond anymore. We'd like to take this opportunity to reconfirm the importance of volunteers. The third topic is standards and the certification system. Firefighting equipment must be able to perform adequately in the event of a fire, and it must not fail in any way. To ensure this performance, Japan has established a system of standards and certification for firefighting equipment. This time, we will introduce the outline of the system and convey its advantages from the viewpoint of an expert. In addition, Disaster response requires not only the enhancement of responder capabilities and the establishment of government system, but also the use of reliable equipment and system. From this perspective, there will be a session to introduce the products such as equipment or materials 
that support firefighting and disaster prevention in Japan. In addition, we will have a presentation from the UNDRR office in Japan, which is promoting disaster prevention policies and cooperation with the Japanese government around the world, as well as from JICA, which is our partner in international cooperation project. Nowadays, natural disaster seems to be caused by climate change occurring all over the world. Typhoons, hurricanes, and cyclones are raising in many parts of the world, causing serious damage to human lives and the social economy. Last year, there were major floods in Europe, and recently, they have been floods in Africa and South America. Natural disasters have become a major risk for countries around the world. In January of this year, a massive underwater volcanic eruption occurred off the coast of Tonga, causing extensive damage over a wide area. In order to respond to such a large-scale disaster, each country needs to improve its own disaster response capabilities. Of course, that is important, but each country has to cooperate with each other. We need to make constant effort to protect our people from fires, traffic accidents, and other disasters that are hidden in our daily lives, too, to all those who participate in this forum. Wishing that this forum will lead to the improvement of our national and regional disaster response capabilities, I will conclude my opening remark. Thank you. We improved our system, therefore we'd like to resume. And next, the next speaker will be the Ms. Yuki Matsuoka, head of the UNDRR office in Japan. Ms. Matsuoka, please start. Thank you very much for the introduction. Can you hear me? Good morning and good afternoon, everyone. My name is Yuki Matsuoka and I'm the head of the UNDRR office in Japan, uh, United Nations Office for Disaster Risk Reduction. I'd like to share my screen with you. Can you see my screen? Yes, we can see your screen. Thank you very much. Okay, I'm Yuki Matsuoka from the UNDRR. Thank you for giving me this great opportunity to address you today at the International Forum on Fire and Disaster Management. The UNDRR is a United Nations agency in charge of disaster reduction and one of its major roles is to coordinate the process of developing international disaster reduction guidelines so that countries can promote their disaster reduction efforts effectively. The United Nations World Conference on Disaster Reduction has been playing an important role in formulating international guidelines for disaster reduction. The UNDRR or its predecessor organization has served as the Secretariat and Japan hosted the conference three times in 1994 and 2005 and in March 2015. In the third conference held in Sendai, Japan. The Sendai framework for disaster reduction was adopted as an international guideline for disaster reduction for the next 15 years until 2030. So today I heard that many people involved in the field of disaster management and firefighting are joining this forum from many countries around the world. I'm sure that government officials from your countries have also participated in the UN World Conference on Disaster Reduction before. The Sendai Framework for Disaster Reduction was adopted at the third UN World Conference on Disaster Reduction in 2015 and was also endorsed by all UN member states in a UN General Assembly held in this uh, the same year. 
This means that this is a high status agreement that requires the member countries to implement this in their own countries. The UNDRR is working with a number of partners to promote, monitor, and support this framework. The Sendai framework for disaster reduction is now playing a central role as an international guideline for disaster reduction. And I'd like to touch on this framework a little more because I think it is relevant to today's forum. First of all, the Sendai framework for disaster reduction clearly states that the national government has the primary responsibility for disaster reduction policy. And it describes the roles of stakeholders emphasizing the importance of the entire society engaged in disaster reduction efforts. The framework is characterized by its three keywords, which are resilience, inclusion, and whole of society engagement. So these are the important keywords. And also, the Sendai framework for disaster reduction efforts uh, reduction specifies four priority areas for action and seven global targets. And the four priority actions are as follows. And these actions take more than half of this uh, framework. So first, understand disaster risks. Number two, strengthen disaster risk governance to manage disaster risks. Number three, invest in disaster risk reduction for resilience. So the strong message here that the, the disaster risk reduction spending is not a cost, but an investment. Number four is to improve preparedness for effective disaster response and build back better in the recovery and reconstruction process. And there are many actions that follow. And looking at the, the seven global targets, and we have four reduction targets. This is to substantially reduce mortality from disasters and to reduce the number of people affected by disasters and to reduce direct economic losses due to disasters and to significantly reduce damage to critical infrastructure and disruptions to basic services. These are four reduction targets. And in addition, we have three increased targets. They include to significantly increase the number of countries with national and local disaster reduction strategies, and to significantly enhance international cooperation for developing countries, and to substantially improve access to multi-hazard early warning systems and disaster risk information and assessment. These are the global targets upheld in this framework. And each member state is supposed to report on their progress status uh, with the UN, especially with regards to the target F which is international cooperation in the field of disaster reduction, the UNDRR has high expectations for Japan as it has been actively engaged in this particular activity for many years. And we understand that this forum is also part of Japan's initiatives for disaster reduction. So I had a mention about the Sendai framework for disaster reduction again in today's forum because your engagement in this field can contribute greatly to the implementation of this framework which is an international guideline for comprehensive disaster reduction in particular priority four preparedness for effective response is an area that is closely related to this forum but it is also significant in terms of capacity building awareness raising and investments in resilience building. In the second UN World Conference on Disaster Reduction held in 2005, the Hyogo Framework for Action 
was adopted, which was the predecessor of the Sendai Framework for Disaster Reduction. However, this framework hardly describes the roles of the private sector. Then, during the decade of 2005 to 2015, there was a growing recognition that the importance of contribution from the private sector to disaster reduction. As a result, the Sendai framework repeatedly emphasizes the roles and contributions of the private sector and collaboration with the private sector. And I heard that in today's forum, we will have many presentations from Japanese private companies on specific technologies and case studies, as well as on volunteer firefighters, which is one of the foundations of Japan's resilience against disasters. I believe that this is the epitome of the whole of society approach. As the Sendai Framework for Disaster Reduction emphasizes, effective disaster risk reduction requires the involvement of the entire society. In particular, the private sector is expected to contribute to uh, building the resilience of society by uh, leveraging its uh, expertise. First, uh, this initiative focuses on the uh, private sector. So you're going to hear a lot of presentations from the private sector. So it's very uh, important for them to build the resilience. So from this standpoint, you know, the UNDRR is also implementing an initiative called the UNDRR Private Sector Alliance for Disaster Resilience Societies, known as ARISE, in which private companies are committed to disaster reduction are participating from all over the world. So there are 400 um, entities already joining uh, this organization. If you're interested in this uh, framework, uh, please refer to our website. And there's another initiative focusing on the local municipalities. And we're participated by uh, local municipality officials and firefighters. So we have an initiative to build a resilient society towards 2030. So this is an initiative to support the implementation of the Sendai framework for disaster reduction. So JICA is one of our global partners in this initiative. And we are already participated by 834 local municipalities from all over the world. And we hope it will be able to understand the risks uh, so that the, uh, we can uh, build the risk resilience and the capability. And we'd like to make improvements by learning from each other. This is, these are the major uh, purposes of this initiative. So today, I understand that we are joined by some part, uh, participants uh, from local, municipali local municipalities. So you can refer to our website uh, with regards to the activities of these two initiatives. So please uh, visit our website. As the previous speech goes, we're affected by the climate change and therefore the rampant weather conditions have been hitting the earth. So the UNDRR is impl implementing uh, initiatives in which various stakeholders are learning from each other. So this is how we understand uh, the importance of this activity. And uh, we understand that the, um, you are joining from various uh, sectors and countries and positions. And, but we understand that the, uh, you are playing an important role in your own countries. Uh, therefore, uh, we hope that you will be able to have a lot of takeaways for your own countries. And I hope this will give you an opportunity to think about how we can build the social resiliences. So I'd like to congratulate the organizers for hosting the forum today. And I heard this is going to be the 11th uh, forum. And I, and I hope 
all of you will be able to work together with the United Nations, and we would appreciate your continuous support and cooperation down the road. Once again, thank you very much. Ms. Matsuoka, thank you very much. Next, Mr. Nambu of Special Advanced Rescue Unit of Yokohama City Fire Bureau will give a presentation on search and rescue. The theme is a report on um, rescue activities related to a train derailment accident. Please start, Mr. Nambu. Hello everyone, my name is Nambu and I am with the Yokohama Fire Department. I would like to thank you for your valuable time today. Can you please see our material? In September 2019, a train derailment occurred in Kanaga Ward, Yokohama City, due to a collision between a rapid express train and a large cargo truck. It was extremely difficult to prevent the fire, collect information, search for human life, triage the injured, and respond to the media. In Japan, there have been 18 trail derailment accidents in the past three years, including this one. In order to contribute to future firefighting activities, which are becoming more complex and diversified due to change in urban structure and social infrastructure, I would like to report on the situation and activities of the disaster. First, I would like to introduce the city of Yokohama, the latest structure in Yokohama, and the Yokohama Fire Department. Yokohama City is located in the eastern part of Kanagawa Prefecture, adjacent to the southern part of Tokyo. A red is Tokyo Metropolitan, and blue is Kanagawa Prefecture. We are an ordinance dedicated city with population of 3.77 million, 1.76 million households and 18 administrative districts. This photo shows the area around Yokohama Station. The city has 153 stations on 21 laid road lines, operated by six companies, including KQ, JR Lines, and the municipal subway, and the number of passengers at Yokohama Station. The main terminal station is appropriately 2.3 billion a day. This photo shows the exterior of the east exit of Yokohama Station and the platform you can see at the bottom at the platform where the JR Keihin Kyuko lines. In this report, we will abbreviate Keihin Kyuko line as KQ line. The upper right photo is Yokohama Station and Grand Passage. Bottom left is in front of the central gate of Yokohama Station. Bottom right is the platform of KQ Line Yokohama Station. This is a map of KQ Lines, which we will explain in detail later. KQ Line has main line, airport line, Daishi Line, Zushi Line, and Kurihama Line. The blue line runs from Sengakuji Station, Tokyo, to Uraga Station in Yokohama, Yokosuka City, through Kawasaki City and Yokohama City in Kanagawa Prefecture. Next is the outline of Yokohama Fire Department. The blue circle in the center is a fire department building. Red circle is a fire station in each administrative district, and black circles are branch stations which cover a certain area. In addition, we have Yokohama Heliport Fire Training Center, EMT, Training School and Emergency Work st Station. We have 3,600 staff and 600 fire engines. We are able to prevent fires, receive and command 119 calls, and we respond quickly to all kinds of disasters on land, sea, and air. 
As shown in the figure, Japan's rescue system consists of rescue units, special rescue unit, advanced rescue unit, and special advanced rescue unit, and is classified according to the vehicle required, rescue equipment, materials, and the education provided to the team members. Yokohama City's rescue system consists of 18 special rescue units assigned to each fire station in each administrative district, one full-time water rescue unit to handle water rescue cases in the entire city of Yokohama, full-time air rescues assigned to the Yokohama airport, and a special advanced rescue unit under the direct control of the Bureau with the main mission of rescue activities and the safe management in special environments, such as large-scale disasters in and outside the city, NBC disasters, air, water, and swift water rescue. Special advanced rescue unit is the highest level of rescue team in Japan. I belong to the Special Advanced Rescue Unit, which has 19, 59 members working 24 hours a day in two shifts, and consists of members who have completed special and advanced training in life-saving. We have 13 vehicles all of which are special vehicles, the only one in Yokohama City. In 2021, we had 230 fire cases and 333 rescue cases. We make full use of cranes, large lights, large blowers, water cutters, small vehicles for transporting aircraft, vehicles that can analyze materials while positively pressurized inside of the vehicle to prevent outside air from entering, and vehicles that can be widened to use the command headquarters and list areas for the team members. In addition to responding to disasters in Yokohama City, we are also engaged in rescue operations for large-scale disasters that have occurred in Japan and overseas. As we will see in detail later, in this accident, the lit circle is a place of origin, and the blue circle as a fire station, from which totally 54 units and 206 firefighters were deployed. This is a flow of today's report. I will divide my report into the following sections, outline of accident, rescue activities, and challenges. We are still in the process of verifying and reviewing the situation, and there are still some uncertainties. However, we have pre prepared this document to let you know the situation of the disaster. First of all, let me give you an outline of the accident. As I told you a little while ago, KQ main line stops uh, in the blue frame. The number of passengers per day is about 2 million, and the number of train operations per hour at Yokohama Station is about 50. Rapid Express trains stop at three stations out of 37 between Shinagawa and Yokohama stations and travel 22 kilometers in 17 minutes. This map shows the location of Kanagawa Shinmachi Station number one crossing where the accident happened. There is a Kanagawa Shinmachi Station nearby, but the train, rapid train, did not stop there. It was suggested to go to Yokohama Station from Shinagawa Station. This photo is taken around Kanagawa Shimachi Station. Akagawa Shimachi Station is near the red frame. The average number of passengers per day at Kanagawa Shimachi Station is about 20,000. National Railway 16 runs along the east side of the station, and there are houses, nursery schools, vocational schools, restaurants, and businesses around the station. This train is the same type as the one in which the accident happened. This is an eight-car stainless steel structure train called Type 1000. The first car is about 18 meter long, 2.8 meter wide, 3.6 meter high, and 33.5 tons in weight. 
and the one thousand five hundred volt DC, maximum speed one hundred thirty kilometer per hour, capacity one hundred ninety passengers, and the bogey is a bolster bogey with a center of gravity relatively low. The accident occurred on September. 5th, 2019, on Thursday at 11.43. The weather was cloudy and quite muddy day with a high of 32.2 degrees Celsius and 68 relatively humidity. Here in this photo, near Kanagawa Shimachi Station of the KQ Line, a collision between the rapid express train and a large cargo truck happened. In this report, I use a train for for rapid express train and a truck for large freight truck. Next, the human casualties. There were one dead, five moderate injuries, 25 mild injuries, 31 people in total. Regarding the property damages out of eight cars, the front three cars were derailed, and the first train was wrecked and burned. Two power poles collapsed and one was burned. The truck was heavily damaged and burned. Due to this accident, KQ Kawasaki Yokohama line was suspended. But two days later, on 7th, the removal work was finished and the line was reopened around 1.30 p.m. Next, I'd like to give you an overview of our activities. I will mainly talk about life search and safety management activities, but I will also talk about the timeline so that we can understand the overall activities. First of all, I will talk about perception and command. The perception was made at the time of emergency on Thursday, September 5th, 2019, 11.40 a.m. A neighbor reported that the KQ had an accident and there was a fire. There were two types of orders, the rescue, ambulance for mass casualties for more than five, but less than 30 injured people, and rescue ambulance for 30, for more than 30 injured people, but there is no category for fire plus rescue plus first aid. At the stage of the first report, the number of injured people was unknown, but we knew that there was a fire. After receiving the call, the Command Control Division consulted and coordinated on what type of order to give, and decided to give the order of rescue ambulance for mass casualties, level 2 deployment and the additional warding of a traffic accident between KQ and the truck, black smoke rising as seen from surveillance cameras. I will talk about whether this command method was good or bad in the last section, challenges, in the presentation, but when I intercepted this command, the unfamiliar command and additional wording made me think first of the Fukuchiyama line derailment accident that occurred in Japan in 2005. I contacted the captain of the same unit who was in another location and we checked each other's equipment and activities. Since we needed to protect against fire and rescue people at the same time, my unit was equipped to fight fires, guide evacuation, and search for people, while the other unit was equipped to rescue and control rescue activities. In addition, Considering the use of water cutters, we took into account the position of the Special Advanced Engineering Unit and also instructed them to prepare oxygen flammable gas alarms, electric resistance clo closing, and simple respirators. We also received information on the radio that there was a risk of the uh, spread of the adjacent buildings. 
and next the pump unit was the first to arrive at the scene of this disaster. A total of 50 firefighters from 11 pump units, including alternating units, participated in the disaster, one of which discharged water from a tank, two units secured water sec source, and three units discharged water from two lines and four pods. And the activities of each pumper unit include firefighting, fire prevention, checking the number of injured, setting up temporary uh, aid stations and triage posts, guiding the injured assisting and the ambulance unit in transporting the injured and searching for human life. At the end of the disaster, two lighting team, teams with light members are also on duty to repair for lighting activities. And the first arriving pampa unit saw black smoke while driving and arrived at the scene at 11.52 a.m. There were stations near the crossing on the East side of the disaster site, where they extended horses and collected information at the same time. We were able to obtain information from the KQ line staff that it was an accident between a truck and a train, that was the train passengers had been evacuated, and that there were people lying under beneath the train, but there was no exact answer to the question of power cutoff, and there were disconnected power lines hanging in the truck site. And when the captain who arrived first checked the truck site, there was already a crowd of people, and as he approached, paying attention to the surrounding station, he found a person in need of rescue lying spying at the bottom of the third car of the train. But the white windshield of the truck was broken, and the flames were spewing from the inside and the bottom of the car, so he ordered water spring while paying attention to electric shock. A person person in need of rescue had his right leg in contact with a box underneath the train, so one of the two water sprays was called in to join the rescue operation. Fortunately, he was not pinched, and his clothes were caught in the bottom of the train, so the rescue was completed without using rescue equipment. After that, the pampa unit handed over to the ambulance unit that had already arrived on the scene, and in parallel with the firefighting activities, blue sheets were spread to protect the privacy of the people in need for help. The second and subsequent firefighting units set up a sewage system around the fire point, taking care to avoid electric shock and firefighters on the west side of the fire area were spraying water, operating pumps and monitoring the condition on the injured people. The upper right photo was taken from the south side Yokohama station site. The lower light shows the status of the horse extension on the west side of the disaster site. In the upper left, the first car of the train is on top of a truck, what appeared to be the lid of the truck's fuel tank had fallen nearby. In the lower left, a double ladder was erected to discharge water from the top of the sandproof wharf. The fire was under control at 12.41 p.m. and completely extinguished at 13.15. 15 p.m. The second arrival pumper unit would usually support the ambulance units, the transportation, and coordinate with the control center if a mass casualty accident that does not involve rescue activities. However, in this case, the second arrival pumper unit will also gather information, release water, and conduct life-saving search activities. The next arrival team is the ambulance unit. There are a total of 17 ambulance units with 51 members. In, this, in addition, two teams from Yokohama Medical Ambulance Team, consisting of ambulance team, doctors and nurses, and a large transport vehicle to transport the slightly injured at the same time. The first arriving ambulance unit conducted triage at stations one and three instructed the second arriving ambulance unit to triage at stations two and four, and then entered the command center as a supervising ambulance unit to coordinate with the command control division and medical institutions. Immediately after the disaster, the injured were 
One, one person was injured on the truck. Twelve people at the station office of the west gate of the Kanagawa Shimaji Station. Five people at the station office of the center gate of Kanagawa Station. Ten people in front of a com commercial facility. Triage was conducted by three ambulance units at four locations and by Yokohama Medical Ambulance Team Waimat at one location. In the midst of the disaster, we were able to borrow the lobby of a vocational school near the disaster site and use it as a temporary first aid station. So we were able to operate without being seen by the media. The number of injured people continued to increase, and there were also injured people who were on the train but walked to Yokohama Station and then called for ambulance service. We transported a total of 31 people. The upper right photo shows the situation next to the command center. Lower right is a part of the list of injured used as a command center. Upper left photo is a temporary first aid station. Bottom left is a situation in the Department of Large Transport Vehicles. This is a triage result of the injured between, between 1216 to 1323. 10 ambulance units transported 16 people. At, at 1.31, we started transporting 14 people with minor injuries using a large transport vehicles. The 31st injured person who requested ambulance services at Yokohama stations was transported at 2.42. The photo on the right shows Yokohama Medical Ambulance Team, Waimat, in the command center, and the first alive ambulance unit acting as a supervising ambulance unit. They are doing a secondary triage and also a vein, and also managing on the injured and the location of the medical services to uh, several posts, and confirmation of request to the medical institutions, and also relocation to injured to the large transportation truck, and also management of the uh, injured person's conditions. The next arrival is the command unit. The command team with jurisdiction over the disaster site is the main command unit with five members per unit. The command unit of the neighboring district is a supporting commanding unit with five members per unit for a total of 10 members in two units. After arriving at the scene, the main command unit immediately received information from the KQ line staff that the passengers had already been evacuated and that the power supply had stopped. However, the evacuation site was divided into east and west sides across the tracks from the disaster site. So the supporting command units were ordered to gather information on the west side of the disaster site conduct the phase command and confirm the injured. Later at 12.13, the chief of the fire station in charge arrived and declared the command and the second command system was established. Under the order of the main command units, the support command team was gathering information, conducting operation on the west side of the disaster area and setting up a temporary first and station and triage post on the east side. At 1.30 p.m. and 2.40 p.m., the chief of the fire department and the crisis management office of Yokohama City Administration Bureau held a press conference. This was only a preliminary report and included an overview of the disaster, damage, number of injured, and extent of injuries. The next unit was the Special Rescue Unit. After 10 minutes, the first arrival special, special rescue unit, and 15 minutes, Special Advanced Rescue Unit arrived. This, 
And in total, eight units and 40 firefighters arrived, and also one unit and 19 members of the special rescue unit arrived. The first arriving special rescue unit arrived at the scene at 11.57 and assisted in transporting the injured in the lower side of the train. At the same time, the second and third cars of the train were searched for human life, and then the search for human life for trucks and the first car of the train was started. The upper right photo shows the third car of the train and the fourth car that hasn't derailed. Bottom right is the driver's cab of the fourth car of the train. Bottom left is the interior of the fourth car of the train. At 12.06 p.m., the Special Advanced Rescue Unit arrives at the scene and again conducts an overview of the disasters, the status of the electric current, risk factors such as flammable gas, the status of injured people on the west side of the disaster site, life searching activities around the train and the tracks, and the risk assessment of the first train car. As for the outline of the accident, we gather the information and confirm the moment of the accident from the surveillance camera footage at Kanagawa Shinmachi Station. We were able to confirm that one person who we thought was the driver of the truck was ejected from the vehicle due to the impact back to the accident, but it was unclear how many people were on board, so we contacted the transportation company, indicated on the truck to confirm the number of the people on board. We also, we also received information that two KQ line employees were guiding a truck just before the disaster, but there was uncertain information that they might have been involved in the accident. So we confirmed and secured two employees who had already evacuated from the Kanagawa Shinmachi Station West Exit Station Office. The upper right photo shows the surveillance camera footage of the moment of the accident. Bottom right is a shot of the lower part of the truck. The top left is a connection between the first and the second cars of the train. Bottom left is a shot taken from the south end direction on travel side. As far as we could visually check, there were no injured people left behind at the bottom of the train, etc. However, since the train was used by an unspecified number of people and there were many loads scattered around, we needed to enter the back of the red circle remove the load and the visually check all the areas and we discussed our future course of action. I was assigned to lead the future search and rescue activities and the safety management phase and after reviewing I decided the location of search and rescue activities and classified them as alpha and bravo. Alpha about Albo are areas where the train is riding up on the front of the truck and and actually we see a deformed truck bed. There was ditch area in the truck site about 20 centimeters high, 40 centimeters wide and 10 meter long, just enough space for a human. At 12.40 p.m., in accordance with the decision on the location of the life-saving search activities, we start a continuous assessment of the situation of the first car of the train and the stabilization the train. At this stage, we had no contact with KQ officials who are familiar with train structure, so we could not get any advice about the train weights and the structure. The inclination of the first train car was barely stopped by the parts uh, stop supported by the truck and had climbed up in the connection between the first and the second cars of the train. First of all, we marked the danger zone and uh, forbade people to enter the danger zone until the stabilization work was completed. Since the related agencies were expected to be active for a long time, we secured lighting and coordinated with them to request prop, uh, appropriate equipment and cranes in cases there uh, were res uh, rescuers in need for help under the train. 
And as for the continuous evaluation of the situation, since we did not have onboard equipment and materials for building evacuation at the time of the earthquake, such as lowering swing, distance measuring instruments, and later my markers, we measured the distance between under undamaged power poles and trains to conduct continuous evacuation. The location indicated by the red arrow in the upper right foot in the evacuation site. And the next is a stabilization method. Our towing team could not enter the area due to the narrow road and the working radius. So we decided to stabilize the area with rescue pole equipment. As, as you can see in the photo on the upper left, there were two places where we could set up the rescue pole equipment, one and two, but we were unsure because the number of rescue pole equipment was limited. And uh, as a result of taking into account our experiment in shifting the center of gravity during the large vehicle rollover recovery doors conducted by the regular unit, the fact that the number one side of the train had already been used for life-saving operations and the fact that the number one side had been set as a precautionary zone, so even if it were to roll over, there would be little risk of secondary disasters. As a result, we decided to set up on the number two side. And uh, the considering the t weight of the train, the strength of the rescue poles, and the space required for the life-saving operation, we set seven rescue poles with a maximum length of about two meters and a minimum length of about 60 centimeters. And Alpha Bravo was operated by two teams, and the operation was completed in about 20 minutes, and there were no injuries. And as for CD, since a large amount of cargo was still on board, and the search area was unstable and narrow, emergency evacuation would take time. So our unit managed safety and took command, and the other six units were organized into three teams and conducted in rotation. This slide shows the search situation in section D. The upper left photo shows a KQ line employees providing assistance in transporting a load outside the danger zone. And upper right and lower left are eliminated load. In the end, we removed the soundproof wall and checked every detail and determined that no one needed rescue or was injured. And with the completion of the life-saving search activities at 12.105, the fire department ended its activities and pulled out of the thing at 21.26. And uh, this slide shows a summary of photos from the day after the accident. In the upper left photo, you can see part of the power line hanging down from the truck. If the power transmission had not been stopped, there would have been a great danger of electric shock. And the upper right photo shows how the train was fixed by KQ. The bottom right shows the crane truck used to restore the train, but it is running inside the truck site due to the narrow road in the vicinity. On the one day, on the day of the disaster, the eight car train was stopped at the location. As a result, there were no rescued people due to being trapped or trapped underneath the train. However, if activities using heavy machinery were necessary, activities like those shown in this side slide would have been necessary. And it is clear that planning and activities were necessary with an eye to the final work. Lastly, I would like to talk about the challenges faced by youth in this disaster. We have established firefighting procedures for large school rescue and ambulance incidents, as well as a manual for dealing with mass casualty and have been conducting various drills and responding to actual disasters. However, this disaster involved a complex con continuous activities such as firefighting, life-saving, triage of the main, many injured, transportation, and on-site public relations.
As a result, we were forced to change our mission and equipment according to the order of arrival, and we were not able to function with the know-how we had accumulated. Specifically, it was difficult to change the content of activities according to the order of arrival for complex disasters, to assign missions to units with different main activities, to manage and control activities by multiple command units, to coordinate with related organizations such as police, medical services, and business offices, and to operate under social attention and surveillance. In addition, since the choice of command type due to the fact that the keyword train over time was not grasped in the first report, there is lack of command types for complex disasters. After the disaster, a working group was set up to study the situation, and the activity guidelines were devised to clarify the types of command and the division of duties among the participating units, as well as to allow for a flexible response. The second is to strengthen the function of the command center. In the event of a large-scale disaster, it is inevitable that information will become complicated. Even if the information is accurate, it may change with the passage of time. It is important to always collect and analyze the latest information and reflect it in our activities in order to end the disaster as soon as possible. In order to support the command center in the event of a large-scale disaster, by quickly and accurately collecting and analyzing information, we have begun full-scale operation of a system in which a unit consisting of day shift personnel from the Defense Division, Emergency Services Division, and Planning Division is sent to the disaster site. Specifically, information obtained from tablets, heli telephones, drones, landmark cameras, etc., will be aggregated, analyzed, and provided to the command center. And the base function vehicle will be used to secure a meeting space, transmit information via the internet and email, and project various types of visual information using a projector to set up a local coordination headquarters with related organizations. Thirdly, regarding situation assessment and the safety management method, we need to have a rationale for suspending and resuming activities in dangerous areas. There are some times when we need to have related organizations assist us in our activities, but I believe that we, as the firefighters are the ones who are most skilled in the safety management. Even with the advice of experts, we firefighters are the ones who make the final decision. Later, we conducted a training session within the unit to verify the necessary equipment and the method for assessing the situation. We are still in the process of verifying and examining this as well, but the photo shows how we are using distance measuring equipment and the laser markers to continuously evaluate whether there is any progress in collapsing structures. The photo below shows the situation assessment and marking during the disaster that occurred in Yokohama City the year after the derailment accident. The photo on the right shows name tags worn on rescue uniforms being managed by the command center for entry control. We are also considering a method of handling them to the command headquarters before entering a dangerous area and receiving them when leaving so that we can identify at a glance the unit and personnel entering the area. Through this disaster, I was reminded of the weight and responsibility of making decisions as a captain. The KQ line finished restoring its trains and resumed operation two days later. I was worried that there were people and the trains and trucks who needed to be rescued who could not be found even after the activities were completed. But I remember that how relieved I was when I watched the video on the news showed that the train had been triggered 
the tracks had been removed and the restoration work was safely completed. I was also convinced that we had done the right thing. During our activities, I think we were able to search for the best method while desperately remembering the stories of rescue workers who had been involved in past disasters in Japan and the cases presented at past national fire and rescue symposiums. It may not be possible for us to set guidelines, prepare materials and equipment, and conduct drills for all the complex and diverse disasters that may occur in the future, but by sharing disaster response cases, various drills, and advanced advances through this presentation, we can use the information to make judgment and decision even if cases are not identical. In the future, I hope that a system for sharing information on disaster response cases and and doors will be further developed so that countries can work together to respond to all kinds of disasters and save as many lives as possible. Lastly, Next, Mr. Yokoi of Yokoi Manufacturing LTD will give a presentation on portable air tube jack and fire extinction equipment. Mr. Yokoi, please start. Thank you very much for the introduction. I'm Yokoi from uh, Yokoi Manufacturing in Japan. Today, I'd like to uh, introduce our products. Okay, so I'm from Yokoi Manufacturing Limited. We specialize in hose cabinets and hoses for firefighting and other relevant rescue equipment. We were founded back in 1958 and we have 270 people. And we have 10 branch offices and six plants in Japan nationwide. So talking about our corporate uh, philosophy, we would like to create one and only value. And under this uh, credo, we are manufacturing our products. And so we specialize in uh, hydrants and the uh, cabinets for that. And then we move on to manufacture uh, the hoses that go in these cabinets. And we have been also selling uh, products in relation to rescue operations. So, this time among these products, we would like to focus on hyd hydrates and hoses. We need to comply with regulations in each country, and we'd like to introduce some of our uh, products that can comply with regulations in many countries. As you know, Japan is prone to natural disasters. So, we have we believe that the, we will be able to utilize this rescue equipment really effectively under such circumstances and regarding the products i would like to introduce anyone can utilize our products really easily easily so this is not limited to just firefighting experts so i'd like to show you a video right now so please put the video We'd like to introduce our portable air tube pad jack. This simulates a situation in which a heavy structure is collapsed in a natural disaster. We will explain the steps of lifting the structure using our pad jack. Insert the pad jack with a pumping hose into a gap or interspace. Open its valve and inflate it as much as necessary. Support both sides of the gap secured by the pad jack with wood shims and release the air from the pad jack. Insert the forklift forks into the gap secured by the jack. 
which enables a safe operation. Here are the main features of the pet jack. It weighs only 900 grams, less than half the weight of an on-vehicle jack. The insertion area on the side is really compact, only 20 millimeters. The hose outlet of the pet jack is equipped with a built-in safety valve that can prevent it from bursting due to overinflation. The pet jack is also very flexible and can be folded in half. You can fold it in half and insert it into the gap you want to widen like this. The pet jack is also very flexible and can be folded in half. You can fold it in half and insert it into the gap you want to widen like this. Next, we'd like to introduce some optional equipment for the jack. These are a set of wood shims. By following the steps in the video, you can safely secure a large gap under a heavy object. Also, there's a lifting platform that allows you to use two pad jack units at the same time. By fixing the main units of the pad jack in advance and inflating them at the same time, you can secure a gap twice the size secured with one unit. Yokoi Manufacturing's pad jack is greatly useful in the face of natural disasters, including earthquakes, typhoons, and floods. Be prepared for an emergency with our rescue device. Thank you very much. So that's all from me. Next, Mr. Ishikawa and Mr. Tsuchiya from Akao Corporation will give us a presentation on personal product equipment and disaster relief toilets. Thank you very much, Mr. Ishikawa and Mr. Tsuchiya. Everybody, hello. This is the Akao Corporation, Ishikawa and Tsuchiya, and uh, I'd like to start our presentation. Akao Corporation would like to explain MU Fighter Comfort e EX personal fire proof browsing for fire firefighters. And since its establishment in 1897, Akao has been supplying firefighting equipment to fire departments throughout Japan. And since 1977, Akao and Teijin have been developing Alamido Fiber Fireproof Clothing, and the performance has been evolving ever since. Our share of the Japanese market for fireproof clothing is approximately 50%. Based on our long experience in development, we, Akao, believe that both heat protection performance and comfort performance lead to the overall safety of fireproof clothing. That is our development policy. And uh, the Comfort EX is a fire food that offers not only summer protection, but also comfort. And one of the features of Comfort EX is its lightweight of 3 kg for the top and bottom. Being lightweight leads to improved fatigue for the wearer. This fire suit is currently under review of EN469 certificate. And this is the internal structure of Comfort EX. 
The outer fabric is 100% amiraud, which is excellent in fire resistance and durability. The waterproof layer is made of Goatex, which prevents water from the outside and releases water vapor from the inside. The thermal barrier layer is specially designed to contain more air for better heat protection. Here is how the waterproof layer works. This is Goatex structure drawing. It has fine holes that are smaller than water molecules and larger than vapor molecules. Actually, there are so many small holes, and the difference in air pressure inside and outside the garments pushes the water vapor outward. The holes in the waterproof layer are smaller than the molecules of the virus, so even if a virus enters through the outer fabric, it will not pass through the waterproof layer. Therefore, absolutely the safety of the wearer can be secured. The design is our company's Akao original one, um, body navy design. Like the model, actually, it does not interfere with the wearer's activities in all body movements. At our company, Akao, finished fireproof clothing is tested on a burning mannequin owned by Teijin, a fabric manufacturer. In this mannequin test, flames are applied from all directions for eight seconds, and the burn rate inside the fireproof clothing is measured after two minutes. The test result showed that the rate of second and third degree burns was 1.8% and proving high flame protection. The fire helmet is made of fire glass, and the interior components are heat resistant to meet Japanese guidelines. The design is the one used by the fire department in Japan. This is a quite common design for most of the firefighters in Japan. A neck curtain called Ashikoro is attached to the back of the fire helmet. The material is the same as that used for fireproof clothing, and it protects the neck of the wearer from heat and foreign object. This is called works quite well. The fireproof boots, boots are made of rubber and have shoelaces to secure the feet and improve activity. These boots are certified to EN15090. The soles are designed to prevent slipping. It has such a structure. And in addition to the soles, Guards are also used to the sole to protect the wearer's feet. Fireproof gloves have a three-layer structures as the suit. And the same as the suit, like fireproof clothing, the outer fabric is knitted aramid. The waterproof layer is made of moisture permeable in the waterproof film. And also the innermost layer is made of cotton, which has excellent moisture absorption and heat protection properties. And these gloves are heat resistant and completely waterproof. In addition, the gloves are resistant to cuts and vibrations. And the, the fire food is made in the USA and in NFPA certified. It is a blend of flame retardant rayon and flame retardant acryl with excellent heat protection and moisture absorption.
So I'm Tsuchiya. I would like to touch on the Rapon AK-1, a toilet unit for emergency. This will be available soon. What is Rapon? This is a, a revolutionary portable toilet with solid seal and tear functions every time you have a bowel movement. This toilet was introduced in 2002 by Nippon Safety and was the first portable toilet with the above functions in the world. And this product has been successful in many ways. Rapon means first wrapping human waste and two popping out the wrapped sealed bag. I'd like to touch on how this pro product has evolved. These have a comfortable and hygienic experience. So this is a typical portable, a temporary and a disaster relief toilet. Nursing care, leisure and construction sites, toilets are smelly, unclean and inconvenient environments in times of disaster. Therefore, we developed Rappen in order to solve these problems. Rapon AK-1 will be soon available as well. So this list shows the history of the Rapon uh, product series since 2002. In April 2022, Rapon AK-1 will be available. So this is Rapon AK-1. The outstanding features of this product are the prevention of secondary infection, no odor, easy operation, and space-saving storage. This is how to use this product. First, lift the toilet seat and set the waste bag on the main unit, and pour the dedicated coagulant into the waste bag. And then lift up the toilet seat and pull out the lever and keep holding up for uh, 10 seconds until you hear the beep. Then push the lever slowly and take the waste back out. There will be no smelling. So just throw away the individually wrapped waste bag. The Rapon AK-1 has a special multi-layer film. It is always clean as each bag is completely sealed to keep the smell and the coli bacteria inside. And also, there's no need for water as the bag is completely sealed. And it's easy to keep clean and easy to dispose of as garbage. And this is a special deodorant multilayer film that can keep the smell inside. So I'd like to talk about the specifications. First, lightweight, compact, and portable. It's easy to carry and you can fold it compactly. In this state, its height is 1.7 meter and even when 10 units are stacked. And approximately 5 kilogram in a simply packed conditions. And this also can save the storage space. And it's easy to assemble. And this can withstand up to 100 kilograms in weight. Now I'd like to talk about the benefits of Rapon AK-1. This can trap bacteria inside, so it doesn't give off any odor. On the other hand, the, unlike the, uh, the outdoor uh, toilet, uh, this can provide a really hygiene environment. This can reduce the bacteria and prevent the spread of a disease. The outdoor uh, toilet can contaminate the groundwater, but this not, does not happen to our, our product. This is an example of Wapon AK-1. It comes with the main unit, battery, and tent, container, and cars. And we can think about many applications. This requires the use of a battery or a generator. I'd like to show you a video on this pro uh, product. 
At the time of evacuation at the home, we need a toilet during the disaster, as we cannot use a toilet at the home. It is necessary to stockpile for about one week, but we have a big problem. But all the leaked from the gap in the back features tied by hand. The bad smell spreads throughout the room. Furthermore, we are worried about the infectious diseases because bacteria also leak. How do we solve this problem? Please use this toilet. This toilet is adopting a special odor sealing film. By pulling the lever, the bag is sealed by the power of heat. So no odor or bacteria leak even after an ex excretion. At the time of disaster, clean and safe toilets can save your life. So for this product, there are five markets. Rapun is already being used in many uh, uh, situations, and we have delivered more than 10,000 uh, uh, vehicles. And we have the health and care facility for elderly people. And we have a market for recreational vehicles, yachts, and boats. And we have a market for construction and high-rise and basement sites, as well as mountain environments. So I'd like to uh, talk about a track record of our business. In 2011, the Fire and Disaster Management Agency of the Ministry of Inter Internal Affairs Communications provided the rescue backup trucks to all 47 prefectures in, in Japan. And we delivered Rapun to over 70 of these vehicles. This is an example of a DMAT. In terms of Japan Red Cross, including their Osaka branch, Saitama branch, Saitama Red Cross Hospital, and Chiba branch, Ehime branch. C uh, combined with the DMAT, we have delivered uh, more than 200 units of uh, Rappan. And we also provided support activities uh, in the face of the earthquake in Noto. We uh, also provided 50 units. And uh, in 2011, the Earth, uh, Great East Japan earthquakes, we have provided 500 units. It does not give off any odor. If you're interested in this uh, product, uh, please feel free to contact us. That's all from me. Thank you very much for your kind attention. Then we'd like to resume the session. Next, Mr. Sugita from Pasco Corporation will give a presentation on mapping through the use of data. Please start, Mr. Sugita. Can you see the slides? Yes, it's, it's okay. We can see it. Thank you. I am Mr. Sugita from Pasco Corporation. Thank you very much for having me opportunity to make a presentation. Uh, from today, uh, uh, the appropriate allocation of the fire fighting equipment using a space geospatial data. We, PASCO Corporation, are not a manufacturer of the equipment. We deal with a geospatial uh, company and data processing and consultation company. First, I would like to explain our company briefly. Here are some representative numbers. The size is the the number of employees is a little, slightly less than two thousand eight hundred, and we will also have we have sales branch in all forty seven prefectures, and we have three international offices, and we are operating in one hundred seventeen countries doing projects. 
Pasco has a remote and prox proximity point of view. We are looking at all of the things, and also we use AI, uh, image processing, and we are integrating three aspects into one. And this is uh, our platform for acquiring geospatial information. Space, airspace to the ship. We have a broad range of coverage. And also artificial satellites, drone, measuring vehicle and shipment. We have a lot of platform and also using optical sensor, laser sensor, microwave, and heat sensor, and so that we can see the surface and grasp the information on the surface. And at the last of the last, we would like to explain our global network. We are operating mainly in Asia, ASEANs, Indonesia, Thailand, and the Philippines. We have a subsidiaries in three countries and making business. And from now on, what we would like to present is our firefighting services we are providing. What we are providing is uh, geospatial information. For instance, general maps, road maps, and uh, fire department locations, and demographic data. These are the data we are dealing with. He, you can see uh, two examples. The upper figure is an analysis of the reachable area of a fire truck. And for this analysis, the load data is used for making a spatial analysis. And the lower figure is a allocation of appropriate allocation of fire fighting force. A demographic data or as a commercial facilities where people gather. These are the prevention, fire prevention objects. And also the number of fire trucks and personnel owned by each fire department. So using this data, we are, go we are making analysis for appropriate allocation of fire fighting force. Let's take a closer look at it. And this is, is a visualization of the reachable area, utilizing a load area. As you can see in a red circle, you can see a blank area. And based on the information, we proceed with planning of the establishment and integration of fire departments and the allocation of personnel and rescue equipment. In this example, this is a management of fire hydrants. In Japan, municipal governments, we are providing services to municipal governments. In Japan, water utilities are supposed to make management for hydrants. So we are sharing information with the fire department and we are keeping records for maintenance. And also we are using a geographic information system, GIS information. So this allows us to digitally manage facility searches and counts of fire hydrants within a certain area. Next, we are going to explain our service regarding the disaster risk information. Uh, uh, this is a disaster risk information service called DR-Info. 
this is weather information and also risk area Com combining these two information and anticipate the disaster risk anticipated and and this helps the, or relieving the work of the person in charge of disaster management. And also we can support the countermeasures in normal time and the disaster time. And we are providing this service to normal companies and government offices. DR Info, uh, a lot of solutions, have a lot of solutions for the offices, bases, and the customers and the suppliers. So first, you can grasp the potential risk of business establishment based on the business partners against natural disasters. The risk of natural disasters varies widely by region. By grasping individual risk, we move from disaster prevention to pro proactive measures. For instance, next, to catch the information with guerrilla heavy rain and typhoon and other information in the target area, so combining the real-time information and the predicted information, so we uh, ensure reliable security and safeguard for the employees and people living there. Also, in case of the large scale disaster, the overall vision can't be obtained so easily. However, as for our using our satellites or airplanes, uh, emergency um, emergency images. Uh, actually, by forecasting the total disaster damage level, and we can provide a very quick response in order to provide such services. Here is the menu list of disaster risk information service, DR info, and there are several situations of normal time during abnormal weather. And in case of normal time, first of all, we have to understand the risk, disaster risk, and also under the abnormal weather forecast, forecasting rail, rail operation restriction, and also in a current of a large scale disaster, quickly grabs a disaster situation. This is the last slide. Actually, the, these are the information which can be uh, placed on the DR info in case of Japan, for instance, in case of a forecast of an earthquake, or that we can check the river floods or ground elevation. And also in other countries, if such kind of information is available, of course, such kind of information can be registered in our systems. And also, we have a kind of a service to make such kind of system to register all the information in order to provide inf uh, important information. That's all from our. Next. I would like to have a, another presentation from Mr. Kobayashi. This is uh, Suzuki from Kobayashi Fire Protectives Company Limited. So we're a Japanese uh, fire um, suit maker. So I'd like to explain our company and products. So I, I hope uh, you have a good time with us. So we are Kobayashi Fire Protectives. Uh, we are a 155-year-old company specializing in fire suit. So I'd like to uh, start my presentation by explaining ISO. What is ISO? This is the, the National Standard Organization. So each region has its own standard such as EN in Europe, NFPA in America and Australia and New Zealand. 
And Japan also has its own standard. And ISO is an umbrella organization that manages all of these standards. So we specialize in ISO 11.999 for a fire equipment. So I'd like to talk about our product called Black Tech X. So general uh, fire uh, suit is made from 100% in aramid. So this is a combination of M aramid and P aramid. And in addition, we also uh, combine PBO fabrics together with this combination. And this is the combination we use to make our fire suits. So PBO has the decomposition temperature of 650 degrees Celsius, which is highest. And PBO it is stronger, much stronger than in Aramid fabrics and PBIs. So this is a technological specification of PBO fabric. So PBO fabric is often compared with PBI, but the PBO is 10 times stronger than PBI. You can find this fact through uh, these statistics. So using PBO fabric, we have successfully made our products lighter. So this is the a, a gross weight of Black Tech X. This includes a helmet, a sikoro, a jacket, and trousers. The total weight of this product is now 3.88 kilograms. And especially among Japanese products, our products is one of the lightest ones. So the, the gross weight of general fire suit in Japan is 4.25 kilograms, but the, our products is 3.88 kilograms. In addition, I'd like to touch on the test results. So this is called the thermal mannequin test. So in here, this mannequin and it has a sensor to detect heat and then this mannequin exposed to heat uh, considering a flash over and it, we detect the, the heat transition and this uh, we watched out for the second degree burn and third degree burn and we obtain a result of total eight, uh, 5.8 percent so this is how we test the durability of our fire suit and the black tech text, we conducted a thermal mannequin test to ensure this quality. So this is the result of the test. The second degree burn and a third degree burn, the, the total uh, percentage was 5.1%. And based on this test result, we made some amendments, uh, modifications. So we made it too slim, but we added some a, a layer to accommodate air so we obtained a test result of 0% with a thermal mannequin test. So this is the long sleeve, uh, the fire uh, suit. So this is uh, the flashover based uh, heat exposure test. And then with full gear equipped, a uh, firefighter uh, can endure heat uh, because we achieved a flashover uh, of 0%. So this product comes in uh, navy and gold. In addition, we have some other color variations such as orange. And uh, we can also uh, add some aluminum layer on the, uh, the fire equipment and uh, fire suit as well. So this is a flor uh, fluorine uh, the material. So this can withstand a certain chemicals so we adopted a Gore-Tex for a breathable feature. So it does, does not uh, pass water, but it, it pass moisture. So we enjoy a major mar uh, market share in this product around the world. Now I'd like to talk about the, the fire helmet. I'd like to touch on FH01. This is a new type fire helmet. This is lightweight only weighs 1,000 
grounds. So these are visors, they are really clear, and this can ensure a wide field of vision, making it possible for firefighters to engage a fire operation. So this is a, this complies with ISO 119995 in 2015. So left hand side, this is the uh, conventional field of vision, and on the right hand side, you can find how widely a firefighter can see through this visor. In addition, we also have a dial adjuster available. The the head size ranges from 52 centimeters to 65 centimeters. This also uh, comes with a mesh liner, a removable mesh liner as well. Lastly, this is the overview of our uh, corporate information. I hope you visit our corporate website. Thank you very much for your kind attention. Next, Mr. Kurasho of Yone Corporation will give us a presentation on the underwater sonar camera for rescue. Please start, Mr. Kurasho. I am Kurasho from Yone Corporation. Thank you very much for giving me this great opportunity to make a presentation today. I'd like to talk about our water rescue equipment, the Pro I 751 SNR Sonar Plus. These are the today's agendas and also company history and sonar's introduction and system and outline, sonar image and the search operation in the video and also the beneficial point of the sonar. First of all, I'd like to touch on the history of Yone Corporation. Kyoto was one of one, uh, once the capital of Japan for more than 1,000 years with a wide range of traditional industry and techniques nurtured over time. In particular, there are many skilled craftsmen in the field of bronze casting techniques for Buddhist statue and the Buddhist altar fittings. Focusing on these techniques, we started the production of bronze, also called garmental cast, and is a processed product. At that time, most of the firefighting equipment was made of bronze, which is rust resistance against water, and we gradually shifted our focus to firefighting equipment, which is now one of our main products. And uh, later, we developed Japan's first ball bulb and started to sell it in the general industry field. For instance, like Shinkansen's toilet actually rose up, there is a totally bulb. And uh, from the beginning of the line, actually our bulb is being used. And also in Narita Airport, the shut bulb for the Narita Airport is ours. Later, we developed Japan's first bowl valves and standard to sell it in the general industrial field. And also, uh, we have also been achieved in overseas markets through the development and sales of rescue search equipment. And uh, we started selling the Pro-I, and after that in 1995, uh, in, ja in uh, January 17th. In those days, our product Pro-I was widely used. And and with cooperation with technological cooperation with overseas companies and also we have been expanding our businesses. For instance, Nozu Maker, um, textiles or, or mixing equipment and also fire research cooperation. We have the technological uh, contract and we have been selling inside of Japan. Here is the introduction. The ultra sound wave and the image search function of the Pro I 751 SNR Sonar Plus enables you to quickly find underwater targets. 
and at the same time, its underwater camera sent an image in real time to pinpoint the object. In addition, unlike, unconven unlike conventional image searching devices, this system allows you to obtain clear images even in the dark and cloudy water. And uh, this system comes in a compact system box for mobility at the disaster site. Here is the Pro-I75I sonar system. Here is a camera underwater. This one, this is IP68 and uh, waterproof up to 50 meters, consisting of a high sensitivity camera and the LED 16 bulbs built in. And the camera can be remotely controlled 180 degrees from side to side, and the wide angle lens makes it easier to find targets underwater. So here is uh, the sonar transducer and uh, emit high frequency sound waves of 1.2 megahertz and displays detailed images underwater on the LCD monitor. Actually, it has two signals from this one sonar. And here is uh, this system also comes with a clamp for boat, so you can fix the transducer to it very easily. The, actually, for the large scale boat, it can be installed very easily. And uh, the built in GPS allows detailed location checks. And uh, the location information can be recorded and marked on the map for efficient search efforts. Then let's move to the outline. Uh, this is an overview of the Pro I751 sensors. The sonar can locate a target uh, in instantaneously and at the same time uh, pinpoint them with an uh, underwater camera. And, and the sonar can find and visualize the target while the underwater camera can directly find them and the GPS function can determine their location in more detail. Like the drawing on the right on the boat, you can use a sonar to a search in a large area and using the camera in pinpoint, you can detect a subject, a subject and very detailed information can, can be obtained. This one is a side image sonar. This emit wide angle 86 degrees sound waves from both sides of the boat with a maximum search range of 60 meters on one side, 60 meters on one side of the boat and 100 meters on both sides. In extensive search areas such as wide rivers, lakes, and the sea, and this system is very effective in narrowing down the target. And, uh, the other two photos on the, the down image sonar emit fan shaped 20 degrees and 6 degrees sound waves directly below the boat. It provides a clear image of the target located right under the boat. And also the right above photo. This is uh, the image is just below the boat, but you can see very clear images as if you are seeing from here. And actually, thanks to this kind of technology, you can make the rescue activity very short.
And for instance, The root of the sonar function allows a quick and extensive underwater surge operation. For example, underwater targets such as shipwrecks can be detected early and their location can be confirmed by GPS. The pro ice sonar plus can search left and right in the wide area in its short time, while conventional sonars take a lot of time to find objects. By using pro ice sonar, you can quick and clearly find and confirm object even in dark and murky water. Now, we'd like to show you uh, the demo, demo image of the pro eye sonar. is uh, will be very beneficial for search rescue and retrieval operations of uh, any group it is uh, uh, effective in the use of uh, search patterns and uh, you know safety of the divers and the uh, search and rescue personnel uh, due to its uh, technology GPS here. This is solar image here. So let's find the human bodies. So human bodies are around here, and just under the boat. is a low visibility. Okay, we found the human bodies just under the boat. See, we made the point on the GPS maps. So around here, now uh, we're gonna use the diver. Diver can go underwater to such a uh, human body. So Yoni Sonar, pinakilala sa amin for underwater search and rescue. So natulungan kami mga divers na males yung trabaho. Unlike na magdadive kami the whole day para makita kung may victim or may patient sa ilalim ng dagat. So with the help of sonar, uh, mabibisualize na sa monitor niya. Uh, makikita natin ng mabilisan yung uh, subject natin. So saka palang tatrabaho si diver. So dun palang, less na yung trabaho namin. Then hindi pa kami masyadong pagod. Sa isang komunidad, kailangan talaga dala ng yoni sonar kasi for underwater talaga siya eh. Search and rescue, so hindi na siya uh, kumbaga mahihirapan pa yung mga taong maghanap. Sa so, tarulong po ng yoni sonar, malaking tulong po yan sa isang komunidad. Pro-I-751 is in the sonar. Uh, in Japan, there are many earthquakes, the tsunami, and uh, landslide. That's why we developed 
in our products, such as recipe products. And in the Philippines, also, uh, there are many natural disasters, like uh, tsunami and earthquake. I think I believe it's useful to use our product here. Okay, lastly, I'd like to touch on the advantages of this sonar. So this system can reduce the burden on divers. Searching can be done from the boat instead of spending long hours underwater. This is one of the advantages. And also, the clear images from the sonar and the underwater camera provide a realistic view even in cloudy water. And underwater exploration is possible even at night. That's all from me. Thank you very much for your attention. Next, from Funayama Corporation, Tada san will give us a presentation on personal protective equipment. Ms. Tada, thank you very much. Uh, good afternoon. My name is Tada from Funayama Corporation. Thank you for giving us the opportunity to talk about. We at the Funayama Corporation have a history of 66 years, and we are dealing with uh, firefighting goods and disaster management goods. First, I would like to introduce our products. Please look at the video. I'd rather not have to. But if it comes to that, I will do my best to protect you. That's what we at Funayama are all about. Our roots go back about 70 years. In 1948, in Nihonbashi, Tokyo, Funayama Tomisaku founded Funayama Shoten, a trading company dealing with fire horses and as a, as a fire fighting supplier. The company started with only two employees. I want to protect the safety and the security of this planet with that single mindedness. Uh, he continued to respond to the voices of his customers. He searched over Japan for the product he was looking for. If there was no product in the world, we, he looked for a manufacturer who could make it and asked them to make it. Sometimes we even made the product ourselves and then one day, if you want a product, just ask Funayam and they will find it for you. That's what people say about us. The business expanded today. The company has over 100 employees. The company is based in Nagaoka, Niigata, and Tokyo. We are connected with all over Japan and the world. The firefighting pump and evacuation equipment and uh, equipment anyway for the every kind of services that is Funayama's uh, fire equipment department. And in recent years, we have been developing our own product not only as a trading company but also as a manufacturer. We hold rescue days and training session to learn life-saving techniques from vehicles involved in traffic accidents. And we are also working to spread the latest rescue technologies. Everything we do is for safety. Utilizing feedback from the field, developing products for every situation. We support faster and safer rescue and evacuation activities. Natural disasters such as earthquake, flood, and tornado, we never know when they will strike us. That is why we should always pay attention to disaster prevention and mitigation measures. At Funayama, we focus on disaster prevention and evacuation supplies such as emergency food.
We have a wide variety of products supplied by many suppliers. We are able to respond flexibly to original combinations. We are also able to respond to urgent large orders. We support safety and security with our industry-leading supply and proposal capabilities. This is Funayama's disaster prevention divisions. In the textile division, we provide uniforms for factories and offices, as well as for nursing care, etc. And we plan and propose products that meet the needs of our customers. So we are able to deliver uniforms that just fit your work area and image. In the environmental division, we use various technologies to create a better environment for daily life. Air conditioning system, water purification using photocatalyst, etc. We also provide systems that optimize the environment surrounding our lives. Keeping the thought of the founders, we always remember to challenge new things. We will find whatever we can. If we can't find it, we will make it. We want to protect the safety and security of this planet. We Funayama are running around the world today. And tomorrow, for this purpose. Thank you. Funayama Corporation. Uh, today, I would like to introduce the firefighter suits, helmets, and firefighter boots. First, the firefighter suits, and our name is a Tough Attack, and we EN Grade 6 have acquired for it. For it. And particularly, outer shell is an emergency layer, which have a strong distinct. This is designed so as to effectively form an air layer when exposed to a high heat frame. When the temperature of outer shell increases more than 400 degrees Celsius, it starts to shrink and build air layer. This air layer decreases the heat transfer so that firefighter can secure the time to evacuate. And the second is, is an emergency air layer. And the third one is a, is a hurricane made. And this is the air layer between fabric and the skin. And also we have succeeded in weight reduction. In total, the three kilograms, including jackets and trousers. In order to make more active, we have seven patterns for sleeves. And even if you raise your arm, the bottom is attached to the floor and jacket will not interfere with your actions. And trousers, they can jump, run, bend. All the motions were analyzed, and they're easy to move design, like U-shaped design. And also there are variations according to the shape of the knees and knees. And also there are variations navy, orange, gold, red, or the combination of them. Uh, according to the customer's requests, we can change out the pockets, and we can change the pocket, pocket positions. And the size ranges from S to XO for jackets and for trousers from S to 4L. We have a wide range of size variety. And according to the customer's request, we have developed a new development suit, new suit. And this is uh, utilizing know how of the hot development. And we are now applying for the EN application. 
and the the feature was uh, reduced the weight of the clothes and also restrengthened clothes. This is a com and the friction is six times and also weight is reduced. And also according to the type and body, it's a body lines inverse triangle shape. And also the dimension around the and then the wrist was enlarged. So this is to prevent prevent exposure and the outer shape is longer and Kepler felt is used and also air and the buffer is used. And the trouser pocket and this is also large pocket so as to accommodate gloves and also knees and knees and this is 3d dimensional to allow the active motions and color color is allow the heat inside to release from the clothes And we so we have a lot of variation of reflective materials. Next, let let me move on to the helmet. This is FKT fourteen o two. We have acquired EN four four three. That means it underwent a severe chest and we have produced a very ultra light helmet the weight is 100 one kilograms and we have a for you ratchet so that just the size so it's very fit to your head and the center of gravity is low so it is deep and it is very stable And the shield structure, and because of the both sides of the hands, it's easy to pull out and easy handling with wearing gloves hand, and the hinge was tightened by the screw with optimal tightening torque. There's no deformation. And we have a lot of color variation, yellow, orange, black, gold, and silver, red, white. Blue, we have eight colors, and also we have two fluorescent colors. Additionally, we can do clear painting and sticker of badge such as a title, and also special design can be added, for instance, an image or an emblem of your department. The, uh, the red helmet is an image of Mount Fuji. Next, Shikoro. This is a 3D silhouette, three dimensional form, and no gaps when wrapped around the shield. And let me introduce the boots. This is a Fire Eagle. The product name is a Fire Eagle. EN15. 15090 level 3 has been acquired. This is also very light, less than 2 kilograms, and also very comfortable to use. And we have various features. First, the ventilation, less stuffiness by air circulation for function. Next, sun reflect special processing on face skin to avoid increasing temperature inside by UV. Arch support, same wave as personal arch form. Next, injection sole, high cushioning and lightweight. Two zone lacing system. This enables the fasten instep and the ankle with individual strengths in one point. And also because of the profile of yellow line, this so that it lasts longer 
And the yellow line is very visible. It's, it informs you of the position of the firefighters. Thank you very much. The next speaker will be Mr. Morinaga from Japan International Cooperation Agency, JICA. Thank you very much, Mr. Morinaga. So I'm Morinaga from JICA's disaster reduction team. First of all, thank you very much for giving me this opportunity to talk about JICA's involvement in firefighting and disaster management administration. So JICA has three major cooperation schemes in fire services. The first scheme is to provide official development assistance grants to developing nations in order to support them financially in improving various facilities and procuring materials and equipment necessary for their economic and social development. And the second scheme is what we call yen loan. This is to provide official development assistance loans in yen. We provide long-term loans to developing countries at low interest rates for the long term with lenient conditions with a view to supporting their development efforts. The third scheme is technical cooperation. So in order to enhance the ability, independence, and the ownership of developing countries, we dispatch experts, provide the equipment necessary, and offer human resource training in Japan so that we can support them in developing human resources, promoting R&D, spreading technology, and building various institutions. So first, I'd like to introduce our official development assistance grant programs. Due to the aging vehicles and lack of equipment, firefighters in developing nations find it difficult to go into prompt action or engage in firefighting activities effectively more often than before. In order to solve these problems, we have been providing vehicles and the latest equipment and materials as well as basic instructions on how to use them. The second scheme is official development assistance loans in yen. We are planning to build a firefighting training center in Vietnam in the future. So in addition to constructing a state-of-the-art training facility, we will also procure vehicles and equipment as well. In line with this, we will also implement a technical cooperation project in which we offer the Train the Trainer program. Lastly, I would like to touch on three technical cooperation programs. The first one is a training program held in Kita Kyushu City for comprehensive firefighting techniques and disaster prevention management for communities. Since 1988, this program has been joined by 283 people from 84 countries. The second program is held in Osaka City as a training program specialized in emergency and rescue techniques. Since 1987, 291 people from 73 countries have participated in this project. Finally, in the disaster risk reduction training program from Latin America, commonly known as the Kizuna Project, held in Chile. 
We held training programs on emergency and rescue techniques in urban areas. From 2015 to 2019, a total of 178 participants joined the program from 70 countries in Latin America and the Caribbean. Finally, I would like to introduce an active activity additionally. JICA also provides firefighting services in cooperation with the private sector. We have conducted a feasibility study on the introduction of multifunctional fire pumps as a countermeasure for fighting forest fires in Thailand from 2019 to 2021. This concludes my presentation. Thank you very much for your kind attention. Uh, Mr. Morinaga, thank you very much. Next, Mr. Aono, manager of the Regional Disaster Management Office, FDMA, in Fire and Disaster Management Agency, will give a presentation on volunteer firefighters in Japan. Please start. And I'm in charge of the volunteer firefighters. I'm Mr. Aono, and I will take about 30 minutes to explain the Japanese uh, firefighters system in Japan. Okay, so I'd like to start my slide. First, please pay attention to this slide page too. First of all, I'd like to explain about the outline of Japan's volunteer firefighters. Actually, here is a drawing of the triangle. This is a Japanese uh, firefighting systems and specifically in case of Japan, this is a, a outline of the firefighting activities in Japan. And uh, as for you, you, the participants, you know, uh, what kind of image do you have about the Japanese cities, for instance, in Tokyo or Osaka? Maybe you can think of big cities like those major cities, but Tokyo or Osaka, they are very big cities, and there are lots of tall buildings, for instance, in New York or London or Paris. Same as major big cities in the world, there are so many uh, great high scrapers, skyscrapers, but actually two thirds of Japanese land is covered by forest. And most of the areas are not cities, rather, most of the areas are kind of countryside in suburbs or countryside. Therefore, I would like you to think of such kind of fact that what we are doing with such kind of uh, base, basic ideas, then I'd like to start my explanation. What I'm showing is the, the drawing of the triangle. On top of that, the, this is the professionals. Uh, here now you can see that the firefighters, uh, fire service departments, actually they are professionals. This is the first layer, and uh, totally about 167,000 professionals. And uh, actually, as their occupation, they are attending these firefighting activities. And the most bottom is uh, the volunteer these are separation groups and uh, your total number is 45.6 million persons and actually this is not uh, precisely can't be the firefighting of, uh, organization but in order to protect uh, the lives and the asset of their own they are voluntary you know, they're working as firefighters. And in the middle, that orange part, 805,000 firefighters. And these are the volunteer firefighters. And uh, actually, the professionals are 167,000 professionals. And volunteer disaster prevention groups are about 45.6 million persons. And just between them, you know, as a middle layer, uh, this is uh, volunteer fighters about that. And this is a kind of brief outline for that. And uh, then about volunteer firefighters, what kind of characteristic points? Okay, so please pay attention to the right side from this orange 
around the area. We can see some comments. For instance, first of all, actually many of them have other jobs. And uh, those people are the members of the volunteer firefighters. And as for the latest figure, 74.1 percent actually they have other occupations and also many of them are working for the companies like company workers that is 71 percent and other than that like you know self-owned uh, business like like farmers anyway they have other professions and uh, actually they are making their living by those uh, main jobs and uh, actually you have to tell that they are not making a living by working as a volunteer firefighters and the second point is that actually about the 2000 municipality government and uh, based on each municipality the this kind of volunteer firefighters are organized and the third one is actually there are grade in those firefighting fighters and uh, though it's very small there is a kind of uh, uh, the benefits you know they can they can receive that however actually the amount is very small therefore uh, the amount is very small and uh, as i said that you know uh, the, actually it's for the professional firefighters of course they can deploy very high level activities but uh, as Frontier firefighters, as I said, they have their own jobs other than the activity as uh, firefighter volunteers. Therefore, once they encounter the disaster or fires, they are deployed and they work quite actively. Therefore, also the the, the volunteer firefighters I in charge of the initial firefighting and also the supportive uh, roles for the professionals. And anyway, they are supporters for the very serious fire fighting. Roughly, I explained, but uh, as I said in the beginning, why? The well, two thirds of the Japanese land is covered by forests, and most of those areas are countryside. Well, actually, in order to maintain the firefighting organization in Japan, if professionals are deployed nationwide, that should be the best idea. However, from the, the viewpoint of the cost, it's quite difficult, and also maintain all over Japan can be very ex difficult. Therefore, those who have their own business or jobs and also if they are engaged in such kind of firefighting activities in the case of big crisis uh, it is great and uh, we have such kind of uh, organization and uh, let's go to the next page so let's see what kind of uh, devices and those are volunteer firefighters have so top left this is a fire engine so they have this fire engine in their local community and in the top left you can find a series of uh, firefighting equipment in the event of a fire they're in charge of handling initial firefighting operations so they specialize in their ability to extinguish fire therefore they have a lot of uh, devices and equipment uh, for that and in recent years the, the natural disasters have been diversified and they have been occurring more frequently so we need to respond to such a recent trend so in addition to fire fighting operations uh, those volunteer firefighters uh, need to be equipped with other devices such as chainsaw and rescue tools, etc., in order to maintain uh, their uh, capability in handling various situations. And on, on page four, this explains the characteristics of volunteer firefighters. Number one, so they are really close to their own communities. So during their jurisdictions, 
basically they either live or work in their communities and we actually ask uh, people in the community to join the uh, volunteer firefighters organization so they're really familiar with what is going on in the community for example uh, where uh, all the people are living and where um, handicapped people are living in the community and they understand exactly who they should rescue in a prioritized manner so they understand these uh, elements because they are leading their lives within their own communities so we'd like to uh, tap into such information in order to effectively implement their firefighting activities so they are determined to protect their own communities through their volunteer firefighting activities and the second point this is about their capability to mobilize their member members and as I mentioned earlier, there are about 800,000 volunteer uh, firefighters in Japan, aside from professional firefighters. In comparison uh, to the number of professional firefighters, the number of volunteer uh, firefighters is five times the number of professionals. So by mobilizing uh, these volunteer firefighters, we would we would be able to cover a wide range of areas maybe they need to uh, uh, search uh, for uh, victims in a wider uh, areas so when we need to operate in an extensive area the professional firefighters uh, would not be able to cover everything sufficiently therefore those volunteer firefighters uh, can uh, back up those professionals so they're capable of mobilizing uh, themselves in really a quick and a flexible manner. And the third point is their uh, capability for a quick response. So they are under training on a daily basis. When something happens, well, they normally work uh, during the daytime and of course they sleep during the nighttime. But the, when there is a disaster that occurs either during the day or during the night. They go to their uh, firefighting uh, base or uh, office directly uh, from their house, from their houses or from their workplaces. So we can mobilize those uh, volunteer firefighters in this way and really quickly and flexibly. And utilizing these uh, three elements, uh, we have been able to respond to uh, various uh, disaster situations in a very flexible manner. And uh, starting from the next page, I'd like to explain exactly what kind of activities they are engaged in. Page five. First, on page five, so this is one of the examples of how they engage in the uh, disaster reduction activities. First, firefighting. So this t makes up the largest proportion in their activities. And in the event of a fire, they work closely with professional firefighters so that they, they can implement a firefighting operations very effectively. So what you can see here is how they try to extinguish fire. And even after the fire is extinguished, they make sure uh, that the, uh, this fire uh, will break out once again so local uh, firefighters are responsible for that so what it means here is that the uh, professional firefighters uh, cannot cover uh, this uh, these things because they need to move from one uh, site from uh, once from one site uh, to another so they should be able to uh, uh, be mobilized really uh, promptly uh, therefore once the fire um, is extinguished uh, local volunteer firefighters are responsible for uh, making sure that the fire is completely extinguished and they are really active mainly in rural areas and once a fire occurs in a rural area it takes a lot of time for professional firefighters to get to this site so we can expect uh, this uh, situation really um, often. So before professional firefighters arrive in the site, the local firefighters, volunteer firefighters, can start the initial firefighting activities because they can reach this uh, fire site much earlier than those professionals. 
So they are responsible for um, the initial firefighting operations. This is their first task. The second one in the middle, this is about their rescue activities. In the event of earthquakes and the, the strong wind and etc., they also work with professional firefighters so that they can get engaged in rescue and search activities effectively. And when it comes to uh, earthquakes and then uh, floods and then uh, wind uh, disasters, they need to work very extensively. Therefore, uh, professional uh, firefighters cannot cover the entire area in such cases. So this is where uh, local firefighters uh, can contribute to uh, the activities. And then on the right is the flood fighting. So I said, you know, actually this is kind of close to the rescue activities, but actually the flooding of the river or in typhoon, you know, the f river flood and the, for instance, road or like, you know, the shopping malls, actually they bring a kind of, you know, the sandbag so that water will not enter the residential areas. They do such kind of activities with those activities, um, the reasonable people or community people and also, they ask the regional people to evacuate as soon as possible. They work, you know, to let them know such kind of requests. And also, you know, some people cannot move very quickly. Therefore, they provide the support for the, uh, the evacuation. And uh, also, the area for the activity can be very wide. Therefore, the, their mobility is quite important. That's why they are very much uh, uh, reliable. And as for the firefighting, you know, they are very good at it because they they know the community very well. These are the major activities of the volunteer firefighters. And let's go to the next page. Actually, this is the um, main task in non-disaster times. What do they do? Basically, luckily, the activities of the no normal time is more in the non-disaster time, for instance. So what do they do? The remain ones, the leftmost photo is uh, regularly conducting exercises, training for handling. And uh, anyway, in order to uh, move very smoothly, they have a regular exercise. Here is the pump. Uh, tr tr tomb training, and also, as I said, you know that kind of you have to use the equipment like a cutter or water cutter or something like that. And also, as for this training, it can't be done during the weekdays, daytime, because most of the people are working for other businesses. Therefore, this kind of training can be done on Saturday or night or on Sunday or something like that. Anyway, we pay consideration to such kind of time so that everybody can take part in. And the lectures in the middle, please pay attention. Actually, this is a, a massage is done to the heart and uh, actually the 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 volunteer firefighters are learning how to do it. And actually, this is uh, the, the, you know, actually the situation that they are learning the first aid, including AED. And as I said, actually, this is the volunteer uh, education and uh, part of that. And as for this kind of activities, uh, the volunteer volunteer firefighters are working very hard. And uh, the photo on the right, this is the raising public awareness for fire prevention and disaster risk reduction. And there are actually so many activities, like in summer, and for the events, target, targeting the regional people. Uh, they can teach points how to use a fire extinguisher or how to place furniture inside of the uh, house in case of the earthquakes. Anyway, such kind of public awareness is raised. And uh, this photo is using the event, but uh, sometimes they visit the elementary school or junior high school student 
so that the young people can have a, a public awareness for the fire prevention. And those uh, volunteer firefighters are involved in this kind of activities. Next, I'd like to explain about the examples of their activities, because with these kind of characteristic points, I'd like you to listen to my examples. And this time, I will let you some example that is, you know, for instance, how they are actually working in the actual disaster event. Therefore, please pay attention to page eight. This is a great it's a Japan earthquake. Already 10 years has passed from that, and it was a huge earthquake. And in Japan, we had a huge tsunami, and it was a very devastating damage for us. And in this big disaster, actually, I summarized our, our jobs or our activities briefly. And in the topmost one, you know, the, as for re how to respond to tsunami. When the Great East Japan earthquake happened in the middle of the day of the weekday, therefore many of them were in the business offices, or some people may be home, but most of the volunteer firefighters were working. And uh, right after the earthquake, tsunami warning was issued, and right after that, uh, they called for the people to evacuate, and also they guided or instructed to evacuate to the hilly areas. This was the most important point. But anyway, uh, actually, the water gate wa must be closed because uh, the water level will be high very quickly. And uh, sometimes they manually have to close the water gate and uh, they checked if those gates are really closed and they did such kind of activity and actually right after the warning was issued of tsunami they start working even without changing their clothes and also at the coastal areas they rushed to the site right after the closure of the gate they visited each household to tell to evacuate as soon as possible. That was their main point. So in the face of such an unprecedented event, uh, professional firefighters were definitely active, but the, uh, their efforts were not enough. Uh, that's, what, that's why we uh, worked closely with local volunteer firefighters so that they, uh, they can exert their capability because they were really familiar with uh, local situations. And this is how the uh, volunteer firefighters organizations contributed greatly to handling these tsunami events. And when it comes to uh, fire extinguishing activities and the rescue activities, as you can see in the second and third boxes, they worked really extensively over the entire affected areas. And in their rescue efforts, they had to face tsunamis. So they needed to make sure uh, that the uh, their local members evacuated to a higher place, but the, uh, their uh, evacuated places uh, varied. So the local firefighters had to understand exactly where uh, those uh, local people had evacuated. And the, the, these local uh, firefighters uh, were really familiar with these things much more than professionals uh, understood. So uh, please refer to these photos with regards to this particular event. Moving on to page nine. This was a uh, torrential rain case in the Kyushu region. So this is the summary of how local firefighters got engaged in this natural event. So this heavy rain occurred in the Kyushu region. So in the Tohoku earthquake, a lot of coastal areas were affected by the tsunami. So local firefighters uh, 
were really active on the coastal areas. But when it comes to uh, this uh, particular event, uh, they mainly worked on mountainous areas. In the northern Kyushu, they suffered a record high levels of torrential rains, which caused the rivers to inundate. And because of that, there were a lot of uh, landslides that occurred in the area. As you can see in this photo, so uh, these uh, landslides attacked uh, local uh, residents and destroyed their houses just like this. And so the rivers uh, flooded and the water f flowed into residential areas. So they had to work really extensively. And they were able to utilize their robust mobili mobilization capability in this event as well. So looking at the photo on page 9, on the left-hand side, you can see a person wearing a traditional uh, Japanese uh, kimono, the uh, festival kimono. So this, uh, these are actually uh, local uh, volunteer firefighters. So they don't have any official uniforms. Uh, this is the, the garment. This is uh, the clothes they normally wear. So in the face of a, a natural disaster, they just go to an affected area without changing into a uniform, uh, official uniform or something. So this is one of the characteristics of those local volunteer firefighters. And lastly, Please take a look at page 10. So this is a large-scale fire that occurred in Itoigawa city, Niigata prefecture. So this occurred in December 2016. Originally, the, initially the fire itself was really small, but the, uh, in Japan, we tend to have really dry weather in autumn and winter and to make the matter uh, to make it worse this area was lined with a lot of wood buildings and this is really close to the sea and therefore they were exposed to a strong wind from the uh, from the mountain into the sea therefore uh, these elements uh, caused the fire to uh, expand really uh, extensively uh, therefore, uh, this actually entailed a, a series of uh, fires that occurred in many places. And let's see what kind of activities those uh, local firefighters engaged in. So, so they wanted to make sure that the professional firefighters uh, engaged in fire uh, extinguishing activities continuously. And actually, it took as much as 30 hours to extinguish the entire fire. And they, they, they had to uh, pump, they had to uh, uh, spread the water uh, continuously for 11 hours. So they utilized the professional equipment, uh, for example, hydrants. So they wanted to make sure that the, this uh, water was discharged uh, under a certain levels of pressure, but they found it quite difficult to do this activity sustainably. Um, therefore, they uh, actually also utilize the, uh, their own uh, uh, hoses and the water hydrant systems. So they helped basically uh, professional firefighters with their fire extinguishing activities. And they utilize their own equipment very extensively in this particular event. And with regards to their rescue activities, as I mentioned earlier, so the fire uh, spread really at a rapid speed. Therefore, the local volunteer firefighters uh, made sure where uh, they found residents and where they could find people who were having a hard time evacuating their places. So they are really familiar with uh, the local situations. So thanks to that, uh, those local firefighters uh, actually guided those local residents to a safer place really effectively. So they were able to uh, support professional firefighters really smoothly and effectively. 
And these are the three important uh, points that I, I wanted to make uh, through the actual cases. So they capitalized on the, the characteristics uh, of the local uh, firefighting organizations. And uh, so I hope you understand uh, what the uh, Japanese uh, local uh, volunteer firefighting organizations are like. If you can uh, learn from this, uh, I, I would uh, appreciate it really well. So that's all from me. Thank you very much for your kind attention. Next, uh, Mr. Kaneko and Mr. Suzuki from Shibaura Fire Pump will give a presentation on portable firefighting pumps. Mr. Kaneko and Mr. Suzuki, please start. Thank you very much. I'm Shibaura Kaneko and my boss, Mr. Suzuki. This is Suzuki. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for giving us such an opportunity. And I'd like to start our presentation with our documents. We are Shibaura. And mainly we are making portable fire fighting pumps. And uh, this is a pump which is a stational and also fire uh, water purification company. Then I'd like to show you what's kind of pumps we are making. This is a very easy one to understand. This video shows a demonstration in Manila Bay, the Philippines. And the pump used is an air-cooled two-stroke pump with two cylinder engines with the model name FT500A. Compare the height of water discharge with a three-story building on the right, and you will see that the water reaches a height of more than three stories. As shown here, seawater can also be used to extinguish fire. However, in this case, the most important thing is to run fresh water through the pump for several minutes to drain out the seawater inside before returning the pump to the storage location. If you do that work, the pump will last longer. And if you don't have it will corrode and it becomes unusual in several, unusable in several years. Then, we like to talk about our history. And actually, Yoshibaura was founded in 1950 and started in the fire prevention and the disaster business, along with agriculture tractors and these ranges. And later, in 2017, our right bow, the bra rabbit brand, was marked by us, and in 2016, we merged into Shibaura brand, and in 2017, as it says, uh, we uh, became independent for the original company, and the Shibaura Fire Pump Company Limited was born. In general, a fire extinguisher can be used for up to 2 to 2.5 minutes after a fire breaks out. And the fire truck is expected to come in 8 to 9 minutes. Therefore, our pump will be the fill the gap between 2 to point to eight to nine minutes. Therefore, as for the performance, that it must be light and portable. And also from the water sucking to the discharge, this time should be very short. This is a very characteristic point of our product. And not just our pump, but actually in general, like this. When the water is discharged from a nozzle, it is thought that the water will go to the highest vertically at an angle of 75 degrees to the horizontal plane, and horizontally at an angle of 32 degrees is the best. Then, under this condition, how high or how far it can reach, first of all, you know, the pay the rest side horizontally water can go about 20 meter with a nozzle diameter of 19 millimeter and the water pressure of 0 0.8 megapascal. And as for the right side, the vertically, 
Wotan can go about 25 meter with a nozzle diameter of 90 millimeter, water pressure of 0.8 megapascal. This is revealed by our calculation. Then, here is the model lineup. First of all, uh, actually the air-cooled two cycle engine models, there are two, and the left one is FT300A. Now, actually, we have at our feed site area, and this is a smallest one. And another one, a little bigger one, is FT500A. As for the FT500A, actually, you know, it was shown in the video in Manila. The same one was used for that demonstration in Philippines. And the small one is 568 and per minute, and the bigger one is 1,450 liters per minute, and both of them are at 0.5 megapascals. That is the performance of this one. Next, the water-cooled two-cycle engine models. Currently, there are three types, and the leftmost is FK500A. This is the same as water-cooled, but uh, which has our country unique radiator engine. And also in the middle, this is P572SA, and actually the rabbit type is uh, used. And also FF500A, and this is a bit different. Actually, this can direct cooling type and both, all of them are 1,600 per minute, and also 0.5 megapascals is available, and the, the such kind of capacity is secured. A little. Let me explain the structure of the pump, as you can see. On the right, this is, you know, the scene, the image is seen from the side. Actually, the just the side of the engine, here is the centrifugal pump is installed. And it means that the clunked shaft and the pump shaft are on the same line. This is a typical structure. And also, I'd like to show you the video. And uh, this is showing the two cycle engines. As for the engine comparing to the four cycle engines, uh, it has many explosions, twice as many explosions as a four cycle engine, and therefore has more output. And therefore, as for Shibaura, we are using these engines so that we can raise the efficiency of the engines. <laughs> And uh, as an immersion case, so the important thing is how you can start the engine. Usually, we use a battery and start it with a starter motor or cell motor. However, if the starter motor fails to start or the battery is not available, by following the law of the recoil starter, you can start the engine. And even the recoil starter breaks for some reason. As you can see, as you can see the photo, yeah, pretty. Uh, of the recoil starter, you can hang the rope to the pulley, and then you can start the engine. So we have three types, three ways of the starting the engine. And since this is a portable pump, this can be used to stand alone. That means attached with pump and nozzle. And there are other ways. We can see, we can put it on a mini trucks and you can use it as a pump vehicle. And you can, as you can see on the right bottom, this is on the water tank. This is a 10 ton truck. 
On a tenton track, pump is attached, mounted, and this is a simplified type of discharge. And also, this is served as supplying water to this tank. And this is an example in Japan, in plants or other facilities. And as long as 10,600 liters of water, we can, you can install FD300A, the smallest one. If you installed it, this is accepted as a fire prevention facility in Japan. And if this pump is installed in, in a building, as you can see this figure, if you you install a pump, one pump every ten floors, you can cover all entire buildings. And as you can see on the left, if there is a dry pipe on the building, you can feed water through the dry pipe. And in our experiment, we have succeeded in feed a pump up to the twenty fourth floor. And there, this is another feature of Japan. In Japan, we have a lot of timber buildings in Japan. And sometimes portable pumps are sometimes used as stationary pumps. And using a remote control equipment, and you use it a discharge water gun, and this is also used as a water uh, extinguishing means. And another means is this is used for the forest fires. The left figure is a fire in palm tree in Indonesia, particularly Indonesia. This is a mud place and 24 hours and two and three days they use the pumps continuously. That, therefore, the durable Shibara pumps are preferred in Indonesia. And the light side is a foam extinguishing system. Now, what the foam extinguishing system is, we have a video and we can show you. And this video demonstrates a foam extinguisher system connected to a Shibaura pump. Then how it is attached between the pump and the horse? A proportional. That is a proportional. This is a device mixing the chemicals and water. And the chemical extinguisher agent is contained in a tank connected to the proportional. The concentration in water can be selected from 0.25 to 5% in several stages. The tip nozzle from which the water comes out needs to be a dedicated nozzle. And also a device effectively produces a harm. And if you change the nozzle, you can change it in a different way. Actually, we are using the same foam distinguishing system and assuming the three-store building and checking whether the foam reaches 10 meter height. This is an experiment. As you can see, the foam extinguishing system is not uh, put out of fire with water. But this is a shut off the oxygen to the object using a form. So this is the main purpose. And please go back to the material again. And this is Actually, this pump can suck up water itself, but sometimes it can receive water from other fire engine or a hydrant or as a horse. They can discharge water. And this is a magnified view. This is uh, pumps uh, connected in series, so you can go further. Uh, 
and send the water further. So in a flat area and in a good condition, we have made a test and succeeded of 90 hundred meters. And the other case is forest fire. We also made a test in a forest fire to, so, that, so that it can go up higher. And you can see direct valve in the photo. Direct valve control the pressure of the inlet port and protect it from uh, obstacles. And lastly, I would like to introduce our website. When you go to our website, you can see the catalog or manual download. Anyone can enter this he here, and you can download the service operation manual. And also, on the left side, you can use the QR code. You can also go to the same site. Another one is a member site. If you enter username and password, you can download the service manual and password. This is how our website works. Thank you very much. Next, Mr. Tokita of Yamaha Motor Engineering Corporation will give us a presentation of motorcycle for firefighters and portable LED floodlight. Mr. Tokita, thank you. Thank you very much for the introduction. My name is Tokita from Yamaha Motor Engineering. I'd like to talk about our company and products. So please show us my presentation materials. Okay. So the world is, is moving fast. Technology is also evolving fast. With AI and DX or digital transformation, technologies keep turning at the speed of light for the better. Carrying people, carrying their dreams for smiles. Bring smiles to the faces of people with our technologies. Hello, we at Yamaha Motor Engineering have been contributing to the creation of a prosperous world by creating new values through technologies and free thinking. On the land, in the sea, and in the sky, from motorcycles to marine engines for pleasure boats, unmanned industrial helicopters and industrial multicopters and more. As an engineering company in the Yamaha Motor Group, we continue to take on the challenges of developing these products. In this context, we are also developing special purpose vehicles and equipment for maintaining social safety and security by applying Yamaha Motor products and technologies. Today, I would like to introduce to you the special purpose vehicles and equipment that will be the companions of the warriors fighting in the harsh environment of disaster sites. I would like to introduce to you some products that incorporate our technologies and passion. These days, natural disasters such as super typhoons are occurring all over the world. We provide the means to rush to the disaster site as quickly as possible and protect precious human lives when such disasters occur. These are the motorcycles for firefighters as shown here. The base vehicle is the Yamaha XT250 Zero to 50, which has been well accepted for its ease of use, ease of handling, and versatility. The off-road performance of this motorcycle allows it to travel rough roads with ease. And due to its good foot grounding and being lightweight, 
This motorcycle has excellent handling and mobility. In addition, the well-balanced 18 horsepower engine allows for a wide range of running, from urban running to high-speed running. By adding the necessary equipment for firefighting activities to this XT250 Zero, a special model for firefighting has been developed. This is a masterpiece motorcycle boasting the manufacturer's genuine quality developed for the 250 Zero. It will surely be of great service to you all. Now, let's take a closer look at each piece of equipment of the Zero for firefighters. A siren speaker for emergency trouble and evacuation guidance. And LED patrol lights. A guard bumper to protect the vehicle in the event of a fall. And an underground to protect the engine. Sub battery for reliable engine starting and charging of mobile devices. Additionally, the motorbike is equipped with a large carrier that enables loading of equipment necessary for rescue and firefighting operations. We are developing motorbikes that can be loaded with a variety of equipment tailored to the customer's needs, mission, and purpose of the activities. We hope you will feel free to contact us for further information. In Japan, most firefighting zero operate in pairs. One vehicle carries equipment and items for initial firefighting, while the other carries equipment and items necessary for rescue operations. Therefore, the zeros can be used for a wide range of initial response activities. They can be used to avoid traffic congestion in urban areas on narrow roads where vehicles cannot enter. In addition, on trails in mountainous areas, these are utilized as a means of transportation to get to the site quickly. This is a sibling model of the firefighting Zero. It is also used in hospitals, infrastructure, company, infrastructure companies, and government offices. For infrastructure equipment inspections in mountains, mountainous areas, etc., taking advantage of its excellent runnability, and for emergency aid in marathon competi competitions, taking advantage of its mobility. And its mobility is also demonstrated in information gathering and rescue operations in disasters. This bike boasts a great deal of versatility. The XT250 Zero for firefighting will rush to the site as quickly as possible and contribute to prompt activities afterwards. If you are interested, please feel free to contact us. Crossbuster LED. Next, we would like to introduce you to the firefighter's best companion, the Crossbuster LED, a portable floodlight with signal indicator. Fierce flames are blazing. Black smoke is blocking the way. We want to save lives. With this in mind, firefighters continue to tackle the hell of fire every day. The Crossbuster LED, a reliable device that cuts through the darkness, has been developed to be a good partner of firefighters. While the Crossbuster LED demonstrates a very high performance as a floodlight, we developed this product with a focus on what is even more important, human life that is, the safety management of personnel who fight fires. Please look at this. Can you see this? The Crossbuster LED is a wired portable floodlight. It 
This sends power from a generator or other power source set up in the external command unit through a cable directly to the floodlights of firefighters entering the scene. This floodlight is of a flexible type that can be operated with either the right or left hand. And there are two different lighting modes. The modes can be switched with a single touch. So you can operate it in front of the handle. The condensing mode is suitable for entry into the scene, and the floodlight emits a yellow light that is visible even through smoke. Because the light is condensed at the center, the illuminance performance is extremely high with a central illuminance of 1,250 lux at 10 meters ahead. In the diffusion mode, on the other hand, a white light is emitted and it is suitable for white area illumination. In this mode, the average illuminance of 170 lux and the illumination range of 8 mm in diameter at 10, 10 meter distance. The performance is sufficient for firefighting activities. In addition, even if radio communication is not available at the scene, the cross pastor LED allows reliable signal communication by sound and light via wired cables between the flat lights of firefighter entering the scene and the command team that monitors the control box. So I will show you how it's hard. A signal like sound, sound like this will ring loudly in the field. So using prearranged signals, it is possible to communicate discovery and escape through two-way communication. Various functions are strongly supporting the judgments of firefighters entering the sea, thereby contributing to proper and safer firefighting. Something seems to have happened. Can you go back to the material? The sound means the cable has been disconnected due to some trouble during the entry into the scene. But even in this case, please don't worry. Even if the cable is disconnected, there is no problem with the crossbuster. The control box of this product has a disconnection warning function. Therefore, when a disconnection is detected, the command team will hear a loud warning sound and learn that some trouble has occurred with the firefighter at the scene. At this time, the situation is more serious an inevitable risk that comes with the firefighters has occurred, but don't worry. The Crossbusters LED has a function that is useful even in such a case. The secret is this cable. The cable that comes with the Crossbuster LED is set for a length of 30 meter or 50 meter. Based on the cable type and its deployment status, the command team can presume how far the firefighter has entered the scene. What's more, 
This cable can be used not only to supply power and transmit signals to a floodlight, but also it can be used as an emergency escape tow rope. Its load capacity is approximately 800 kilograms force. With a cable fastened to the firefighter's fire suit, you can drag out even a heavily armed firefighter who has become unable to move by pulling on the cable. You can rescue your valuable colleagues safely and quickly. How did you like the presentation? In addition to the features introduced today, this device has various features, so if you are interested, please feel free to contact us. XT250 Zero, a motorcycle for firefighting with genuine manufacturer quality. X, a crossbuster LED, a portable floodlight that values human life above all else. We at Yamaha Motor Engineering will continue to bring smiles to the face of people around the world with our technologies. Please keep your eyes on us. Thank you very much. Next, Mr. Kubahara, who is in charge of international standards at the Fire and Disaster Management Agency, will make a presentation on fire prevention uh, measures in equipment and the certified system. Hi, this is Kubahara. And today, I'd like to talk about the certification system in Japan as for the fire prevention measures and equipment and the play the shores the document. First of all, the title is Fire Prevention Measures and Equipment Certification Systems. Let me start the explanation. There are four themes, major ones. First of all, the fire prevention scheme. Let me start. In this slide, Actually, it is saying about the major scheme in Japan as for the fire prevention. And in Japan, for instance, you know, the, the subject to protect should be kind of buildings that are the subject for the fire prevention. And uh, actually, you know, it can be secured by installation of the hardware and also the software. From both sides, we'd like to deal with that. For instance, uh, like, you know, the buildings, for instance, majorly, mainly the residential areas and also the, uh, like, apartments. And as for the, the individual houses, of course, you know, the alarm system should be installed and also the apartment or something like that, like hotels or uh, in hotel, care house, school, factory, and underground shopping areas. For these buildings, there are several requirements, but uh, as for the individual houses, of course, you know, the installation of the fire alarm is required. And the number two is the fire prevention management system. Because you know, there should be a kind of a system to control the fire prevention management, and uh, for the each buildings, the uh, the the fire prevention manager, the fire prevention plan, and the self evacuation during or periodic report are required. And it's for other ones, you know, for instance, a disaster prevention management system because in order to deal with earthquake or something like that, such kind of responsible person must be designated. And number four is fire equipment. Actually, the, it is the, the requiring to install the fire fighting or fire extinguishing equipment like a sprinkler. And also the alarm system and also the for the evacuation activities, the um, the guide lamp or something like that, and also and also fire retardant regulations are applied. For instance, a larger larger building or something like that, application to carpet and curtain, and also not only for such kind of requirement, but you know, let's go back to the number six, authority of fire department on-site inspection 
and the order actually in order to improve the current the situation. And even if there is no improvement, there, there is a kind of punishment imposed for such kind of facilities regarding the facility. It's not a regulation the, for the building itself, but for instance, there are lots of uh, requirement in the ink the equipment installed which uses fires, you know, uh, there is a kind of requirement to take a certain distance, such kind of regulation is existing in order to protect those facilities. And uh, for instance, equipment or the software control, actually Japanese uh, fire prevention activities are done. And the next slide, actually this is a trend in fire accident and fatalities. Um, from the 1960s and 70s, by accidents and fatalities from Japan, from higher in Japan, increased. However, from 1990s, the total number of the fires and the fatalities decreased. And nowadays, it is has been gradually decreasing. And actually, this graph shows up until 2019. However, the fatality is kind of declining. However, the decline of this fatality is not naturally happening, but actually we are making a lot of effort, like revising the uh, regulation or something like that. And actually, this is the development in fire prevention with lessons from fire accidents and uh, from Showa era to Ari Heisei era, especially in from 1965 to 1998, uh, large scale fire accident occurred, causing mass casualties such as hotels and the department stores. And in order to learn from the accident, like a sprinkler system or automatic alarming system, was required and such kind of regulation was enhanced. And uh, like in 1974, retroactive application of the standard in fire equipment. And uh, actually that was applied. And also other than that, from 1960s regulation with the requirement of the equipment or or the fire prevention manager system and the fire for safety certification mark, not just a hard, but a soft side, you know, there is a kind of system to do. In recent years, as opposed to the big uh, scale fires, we experienced a small size fires in, in multi-tenant buildings and individual houses. So reflecting the, uh, such a fire trend, we established uh, reinforced the uh, requirements for uh, sprinklers and automatic uh, fire extinguishing systems and also we respond to uh, the advancement in technology and in a package type uh, the sprinklers and, uh, and automatic fire alarm systems so we uh, have taken uh, measures for these newly established technologies since uh, 2002, uh, we actually uh, implemented the in inspection and reporting system, and we reinforced the penalty, uh, such as uh, naming regulation uh, breached buildings. And also, especially since 2006, uh, we observed a trend that the number of casualties increased uh, due to uh, house uh, fires, therefore, we obliged the uh, residents to install the, the fire alarm systems for uh, houses at their houses. Now I'd like to move on to explain the certification system uh, to fire equipment. First, so let me talk about the purposes of introducing the certification system. So what is required for uh, firefighting equipment? At normal times, we should be able to uh, watch out for uh, any fire and they should function appropriately in case of fire, etc. In order to make it happen, there are four elements that we need to consider. First, we need to make sure that the 
uh, each equipment has its own uh, performance to be fulfilled and then this information uh, is stipulated in laws in japan and this equ equipment should be installed appropriately so we have established uh, requirements and criteria uh, for the appropriate installation of this equipment and the we also uh, oblige it owners uh, to report on their uh, the equipment and we need also make sure that the, these devices are developed uh, in a way that they, they contain various uh, functions and performances required. So we make sure uh, these points uh, based on our uh, inspection and the self-labeling systems, which I'm going to mention later on. So I, I'd like to talk about how we choose uh, the fire and the fire uh, prevention equipment. So, so this equipment will be utilized once a fire occurs. Therefore, it would be difficult for uh, regular uh, owners to uh, check the, their uh, functions at normal times. So, but the, uh, we need to make sure uh, it works well in, in emergency. They should be able to uh, show a proper functions. So, and then this uh, this includes uh, um, equipment that needs to be inspected by a third party. And when it comes to uh, the other group of equipment, it does not require inspections uh, from a third party. But the these devices uh, must be uh, proven their functions by their own manufacturers. So I'd like to go into details about this inspection and self labeling systems. First, regarding uh, fire prevention uh, equipment, we basically restrict uh, sales of such equipment by law. We require these uh, devices to carry uh, these marks on the left-hand side. Without these marks, uh, these uh, products and devices uh, will not be able to be sold or utilized. And we have another one, and a self-labeling system uh, based on makers. And when it comes to the inspection system on the left-hand side, this requires uh, an inspection from a third party. And under the self-labeling system, each manufacturer uh, needs to uh, conduct inspections to make sure that the, their products uh, would work appropriately in the event of disasters. Otherwise, they would not be able to sell these products. And you know, at the bottom, and we have 12, 12 items uh, for this um, mandatory inspection system. So basically, the Minister of Internal Affairs and Communications uh, approves uh, the, the type models. And based on that, the, the Japan Fire Equipment Inspection or other relevant uh, registration and organizations, they make sure that the, these products uh, meet the requirements for uh, the type models approved. And without these marks, uh, they would not be able to sell these products. And for a self-labeling uh, system, there are six items. But the manufacturers need to report on these uh, devices to the ministry. So they should be, so these products should meet uh, requirements uh, set by the nation. And they need to carry uh, labels, as you can see on the right-hand side. Without these marks, the, these manufacturers will not be able to sell their products. So looking at the, uh, this equipment in more detail, so the, uh, for, for those requiring mandatory inspection system, there are 12 items. And the first, uh, the fire extinguishers. And the second, the uh, fire extinguishing agents. The third, four form of fire extinguishing agents and enclosed sprinkler heads and the water flow detecting devices and deluge valves. And for evacuation, starting from item number seven, metallic escape ladder descending lifelines. And for alarms, this includes detectors and a manual cell points of fire detection and alarm systems, transmitter, control panel, and home fire alarms. There are 12 items. And those items have to have to be the kind of targets of the inspection. Then let me explain about the flowchart of the mandatory inspection. First of all, in the middle of the 
slide, um, the application for the model test. The, each company has to apply for that. And uh, as for the application for the model test, actually, the, it, is, um, it has to comply with uh, uh, technological level of performance. Therefore, actually, you know, they have to apply for the model test. And, uh, and the Japan Fire Equipment Inspection Institute or Regulated Inspection Authority uh, said that if there is no problem, uh, the result will come. And after that, the, the companies can start actually production. And number four, you know, uh, the applicable for the model approval and the Ministry of Internal Affairs and Communication. If, if they think it's, there is no problem, the certificate can be uh, approved. And uh, after the application is the model test passed, uh, the product can be made. And again, the uh, Inspection Institute will check it. That is the number six flow. And uh, and anyway, the carry and the inspection and the number seven, the arrow, uh, the conduct of a model conformity mandatory inspection, and again shipment of the product for the first time. This is uh, number eight arrow. This is the flow, and especially number six application for model conformity mandatory inspection as for the concrete uh, content of the inspection, let me say simply, like durability or anti-corrosion or something like that is included. Let me go back to the first one. For instance, you know, the, the number one fire extinguisher, the, the first, you know, the safety bulb is there. And uh, if it's not corroded even under the ordinary environment of a number four, the closed sprinkler head and for this one, For instance, you know, the kind of acid agent is added to check if it can be corroded or not. And the number nine, by such detectors and uh, manual core point, like, you know, the, when the um, electricity is applied, the cold water or warm water or water is, is used, you know, the actually the performance check is done like that as for the durability. And anyway, it has to check if they are complying with uh, requirements. In case of Japan, with these kind of systems, you know, we are securing the safety, and the Japanese government is uh, determining the kind of technological uh, standard which is matching the Japanese climate and inspection uh, institute check. And there are anyway three systems applicants, it means three, and also the Inspection inst uh, Institute. Next, the equipment and the tool subject to self-labeling. And there are six items, power-driven fire pumps, the fire hoses and the fire suction hoses, and the coupling for fire hoses, and the aerosol type disposable fire extinguishers, and there are six electric leakage fire alarm devices. And as for the flow chart in self labeling system, the arrow number is a little less. However, as for the standard itself, actually, the standard is um, stipulated in the laws and regula regulations in, in the Japanese government. Therefore, the producer have to comply with that. And uh, and uh, so the re result will be submitted to the Ministry of Internal Affairs and Communication and anyway, confirmation if it is actually conforming to it. And uh, the result is recorded. And uh, on top of that, the shipment of the product will be made. However, in number one and number three, Actually, you know that, of course, you can ask to the uh, Japan Fire Ex Equipment Inspection Institute. And uh, 
And if the such kind of label is not attached, you cannot sell. And also, also the subject for the inspection, if they sell without labels, or if it was found that it's not conforming to the standard, the recall of the product or punishment will be added. The third item. So I'd like to introduce uh, fire equipment. So this is about flexibly setable fire equipment. First, home fire alarms. As you can see in the top right, the home fire alarms quickly detect occurrence of fire incidents at, ho at home to residents. So it, uh, it is composed of detectors and alarm equipment. So this is powered by uh, batteries and then you can install it later on. So these are the characteristics. Uh, again, it is powered by batteries and this, uh, these batteries can last for 10 years. In the case of an emergency, this goes off an alarm and we need to make sure uh, this uh, alarm uh, goes off. And then it's easy for us to uh, inspect this uh, device. And the, the ceiling on the upper part of the wall is the place where this uh, product goes in order to detect uh, smoke. And this detects smoke, but sometimes it's hard to distinguish smoke from fire uh, from, uh, from the smoke from cooking. So this device has a system to uh, distinguish these two types of smoke. And it is required uh, for homeowners to install this uh, fire or alarm system, basically. So, but the installation ratio is around 80 to 82%. And the, it has become mandatory uh, since uh, 2008. As you can see in this graph, while well, looking at the relationships uh, with the installation rates and the number of fire cases occurring, and the number of fire cases has been in, uh, decreasing in proportion to uh, the rise in the installation rates. So if uh, the house is equipped with the uh, fire alarm, the, the number of uh, casualties uh, decreases by 40%, and the, the area uh, of burnt down, burnt down uh, can be reduced by 50%. And this is an automatic fire extinguishing system connected to the uh, tap water system so the sprinkler system needs to be installed uh, within the housing structure. This could be costly. However, if we try to install this sprinkler uh, in, the, in, the, in, the, in an existing house, but the, uh, some products can be installed really easily, especially for hospitals and then home care facilities. Well, this is, these are the places where uh, people, uh, vulnerable people are living. They cannot evacuate their places on their own. So if uh, a fire occurs, uh, this could cause a huge uh, um, casualty. So this kind of uh, automatic uh, extinguishing system would be required. On the left hand side, this is a packaged automatic fire extinguisher. So you can put uh, tanks of chemicals on the rooftop. And so that the uh, this uh, chemical can be provided uh, from the rooftop to each room and to each device and a middle type middle one the automatic fire extinguisher connected to the water system this can be connected to the tap water system and this can function as a sprinkler on the right hand side the packaged automatic fire extinguisher for small size facilities so this is a small size a packaged type automatic fire extinguishing equipment so by utilizing these devices, we can prevent fire uh, for existing houses as well. And this is just one operation for escape ladders with easy to use and no failure. This is the evacuation ladder. So normally, as you can see in the leftmost uh, photo, uh, this is stored like this, but the, you can and open this and then you can uh, prepare a ladder like this and in a case of a fire it residents can evacuate their places really easily 
and quickly. So these are some examples of easy to use uh, devices, uh, fire extinguishers and then and then evacuation tools. So I think the, we should utilize these uh, devices and functions uh, more often. And then lastly, this is a publication uh, from the Fire and Disaster Management Office. Possible evolution of Japanese fire equipment. Actually, you know, as for the Japanese, they're excellent products, as we I explained today. And the detailed information of the product, excellent ones. And we made such kind of brochure. Therefore, if you uh, want, please let us know. And also, detailed technological standard, what kind of inspection is done. Today, actually, it was quite difficult to provide today. Therefore, as for the detailed information, actually, the website of Japanese, you know, firefighting agency. Therefore, if you have any requests, of course, please visit our website. And the content of our inspection systems can be confirmed by you easily. That's all from me. Next, Mr. Matsumoto Yezaki of Orido Corporation will give a presentation on fire escape apparatus. Please start. Hello, everyone. I am Yezaki Norihisa, a public relations officer of Orihiro Orido Corporation Ltd, a comprehensive evacuation equipment manufacturer. We are an evacuation equipment manufacturer founded in 1928. We strive to manufacture safe and secure evacuation equipment that clears Japan's strict standards. Kawaii in Japanese has become a well-known word in the world. Descent is called Orido in Japanese. Please take this opportunity. Please look at our image commercials first. それだけのために。いつまでも。どこまでも。君のそば。いざという時、それだけのために。避難器具はオリロ。頑張れ、オリロ。はい、えっと続きます。Next, I would like to introduce four distinctive products. The first one is slow descent machine. The features are one. It descends at a constant speed.
And the next product, second product is a hatch type escape ladder. The feature is one child lock is standard equipped that prevents sudden accidents in children. Two, for crime prevention, it usually does not open from below. Three, there are also types that operate on the lower floors and evacuate to the upper floors in areas where rescue objects cannot be reached by ladder trucks, evacuation from underground Moors and tsunami and flood areas are ex expected. Number four uses a slide type ladder that makes it easy to get off even with unexpected obstacles. Then please see the video of hatch type escape ladder. And let me move on to the third one, the escape chute. The features are, one, it is covered with cross during descent, so you can reduce fire and fear of falling. Number two, evacuation equipment recommended for buildings that are expected to be used by vulnerable people who have difficulty using evacuation ladders and slow down machines. For example, hospitals, elementary schools, facilities for the elderly, and so on. Three, there are two types, a sliding type that slides down and a vertical type that descends spirally. Today, I want to show you the vertical type escape chute today.
next last is a hanging escape ladder the features are one you can just place it by the window or on the balcony two there are three types of metal fittings according to the place to hook the evacuation from the lower floors of the second and third floors for lightweight because it is made of aluminum there is little burden after installation and after st and storage storage after training five overwhelming low budget compared to other equipment That's all from our company. Thank you. Next, Mr. Akaike of Tamada Corporation will give us a presentation on firefighting water tanks. Mr. Akaike, please start. Good afternoon. My name is Akaike from the Overseas Business Department of Tamada Corporation. I'd like to explain the profile of our company. So today, we'd like to talk about our company based on three aspects. First, I'd like to talk about the overview of our company and moving on to our business and our overseas operations. So our tank is suitable for uh, storing liquid. So uh, please understand our company uh, with three numbers. First, 72. The company was founded in 1950 as Tamada Seisaku in Kanazawa, Ishikawa Prefecture, Japan, and changed its name's first Tamada Corporation at the occasion of its 70th anniversary. Second number is 13. Today, we have 13 sales offices all over Japan and three factories in Hokuriku, Tochigi, and Kumamoto. And the third number is 1. We are the leading manufacturer in the field of underground tanks with a 70% share in the domestic market. In addition to manufacturing tanks, Tamada provides our customers with comprehensive services for their storage systems as a whole. We design, construct, and maintenance gas stations, various refueling systems, and dangerous facilities. In addition, we are currently developing energy plants actively for ships, airplanes, as well as refueling facilities for medical helicopters. In recent years, we have seen an increase in the installation of fuel and water tanks in buildings as part of BCP, or business continuity planning for companies and medical institutions. As a new business, we are also developing and providing a remote monitoring system for underground tanks. I'd like to talk about SF uh, double wall tanks. S stands for steel. And F means FRP, which is an acronym for Fiber Reinforced Plastic. FRP is characterized by its lightweight properties and high strength. It is also superior in water and chemical resistance, and it does not gather rust like steel. 
In line with the revision to the Fire Service Act in July 1993, the conventional steel and steel type was evolved to the SNF type with its outer shell material switched to FRP, which was newly approved under the revised regulations. The new tank is groundbreaking in that it has a built-in leakage detection device. The SF double wall tank has three features. First, economical. Our original spray-up method automates the FRP coating on the outer shell of the tank. This shortens the production processes and achieves both high quality and low cost. Next, safety. The SF double wall tank is equipped with a function to detect the leakage of hazardous materials. There is a detection layer between the steel plate and the FRP, and a detection tube penetrates from the top to the bottom of the tank and connects to the detection layer. If a hazardous material leaks out, of, leaks out from the tank, it will be trapped into the detection tube, activating the float sensor of the leak detection device and trigger, triggering an alarm. The outer FRP section has been certified by KHK or the Hazardous Materials Safety Technology Association. It can also be utilized for the storage of fuel that contains alcohol. We also have a strict quality control system. We check for the water pressure around the steel components, the thickness of the FRP area, and the pinholes, as well as conducting air tightness and hydraulic tests. Applying the technology of SNF double wall tanks, we also manufacture and sell water storage tanks for fire control. This product called Aqua Angel is an earthquake resistant water storage tank for fire control that enables you to secure the water required in an emergency. This consists of a sturdy and durable, a sturdy and durable three layer structure and a 25% market share. This consists of three layers which makes this uh, structure really sturdy. This product is also certified by the Fire Equipment and Safety Center of Japan, and you can select from various types according to installation conditions. One piece, horizontal cylinder type. This is a suitable for spacious area. It has an integral, seamless structure and takes half a day to install. The second type is the horizontal split type. This is suitable if delivery routes are narrow, this can be installed with lightly equipped vehicles and heavy equipment. It takes one or two days to install. Third one, the pneumatic uh, Kaisen method, standing type. This is suitable for narrow installation areas or delivery roads. This can be transported by small trucks, but it takes a week to be installed. Next, I'd like to talk about aqua pit. So this can store water for drinking or firefighting in the event of a natural disaster. It has an emergency cutoff valve that automatically closes when a disaster occurs to secure the water in a tank. Open its manhole, connect a fire pump or a manual pump to the water intake, and you can pump up the water from the tank. Aqua pit can be directly connected to the water pipes allowing the water to circulate constantly within the tank. With the new incoming water pushing out the old water, this tank can always supply fresh water. And there are a vari variety of tank types available to meet your needs. The large type is designed for large facilities such as hospitals, apartment buildings, and evacuation areas like community centers, schools, parks, factories, and outdoor areas. This can secure drinking water for up to 11,000 people for three days. The medium sized type is for apartment buildings, general buildings, small public facilities, and meeting places. This can store drinking water for up to 4,400 people for three days. And the small type is for general households and can store drinking water for 36 people for three days. The problem. In the past, most of the underground tanks in Japan were single wall tanks, so corrosion of the tanks from long years of use could lead to oil leaks into soil and rivers, causing far reaching consequences. In response, 
On July 8, 2010, notice number 144 of the Dangerous Goods Safety Office was issued in which the risk levels of leaks were classified based on the number of years after installation. Once the hazardous material leaked, the cost of the recovery and soil restoration could be enormous. In addition, replacement of the tank could be also expensive and time-consuming, and gas station would need to stop operations during construction work. Solution on February 27, 2007, the Director of the Dangerous Goods Safety Office of the Fire and Disaster Management Agency issued notice number 48 of the Dangerous Goods Safety Office. This is a guideline for the FRP lining work for the protection of the interior surface of the steel and the ground tanks. The FRP line is effective to prevent corrosion for the existing steel and the ground tanks. Tabata has a 50% market, market share for this particular business in Japan. This is a process of applying FRP on the interior surface of the tank in multiple layers. This method takes advantage of the strength of steel and that anti-corrosion property of FRPs. The FRP line method has the following four characteristics. Economical, compared to the cost of the replacing an old tank with a new one, the FRP lining work can be done for one third of the replacement cost. Short construction period, it only takes about a week for a 10 kilo liter tank, also we can cover four tanks at the same time, thus only requiring about two weeks to complete this work for ta tanks. Experienced staff, during our 20 years of experience in this field, we have done this work on more than 10,000 steel underground tanks. We can assure you of solid, reliable work with the technology we have developed over the years. FRP, we use FRP material that has the same level of quality as the one we use for the outer wall of the s f double wall tank, which is our main product. By applying this FRP to the interior surface of the tank, we can prevent the corrosion from expanding risk to the service life of the tank through 10 years. Our slogans deliver Tamada's tank to the world. Tamada aims to introduce Japan's art of manufacturing to companies worldwide that look for new technology to acquire market competitors further. In China and Southeast Asia, SF double shell tanks are becoming more popular due to their high level of safety. Against the backdrop of these market trends, we have been providing our technology to overseas since the end of the 20th century. We provided our technological Technology to Malaysia in 1998, Thailand in 1990, and China in 2005. Next to Taiwan, privatized its gas station business in 1987, and there are currently 22,486 gas stations in Taiwan as of January 2021. According to the past statistics, there were 1,723 gas stations in 1998, excluding those that were closed or suspended to repair or renew, it is estimated that there are about 100 gas stations that have been operated for more than 20 years. As of 70 to 80 of the underground tanks in Taiwan and uh, steel single wall tanks, the risk of gasoline leakage could be high if they are used for more than 20 years. We provided our FRP lining technology to Taiwan in 2006. 15. Starting from 2013, we worked with the Official Development Assistance, ODA, and conducted a tec technical cooperation project for manufacturing and buying s and double wall tanks for the largest oil, oil cell company group in Vietnam in February 2014. We established a wholly owned subsidiary, Taiwan um, the Vietnam Company Limited, and built a new factory in the suburbs of its capital city, Hanoi. Currently, there are 80 employees working at our plant over there with three Japanese experts. It is one of our strengths to be able to manufacture our products under the same condition as in Japan. In addition to our main products such as double wall tanks and water tanks for fine control, our factory in Vietnam also manufactured processed steel products for plant engineering. With the help of our professional techniques and engineers, we have exported our canned products to Japan, the Philippines, Russia, and Sri Lanka. Also, in order to build global factories, the pressure vessels manufactured in Vietnam are qualified as class two pressure vessels in Japan, as well as U class by the ACMA, and will we make first the efforts to comply with the regulation in other countries as well.
当社 SF20 カクタンはアンダーグラウンドタンクスからストアガソリンやザーメタリアズアワー SNF ダブルボタンクイズスプレイアップ SLP ホイズアウトシェッボールアンダーハザブルトンリークディクションディバイスとインシュアハイレベルセーフティーワンオブザメインフィーチャーズオブザタンクイズスプレイアップ FRP フォーミングプロセスウィチャーズビユースインジャパンフォアバー20イヤーズアンイズセーフェスティーハイエスクオリティメソッド In Japan, we introduced this method for underground tanks for the first time and achieved a seamless outer FRP tank successfully. We will explain this process flow as well as its features and safety. Tamada Kogos SNF double wall tanks are manufactured through the following processes steel plate bending, welding, water process inspection, FRP processing, and the outer wall FRP inspection. First of all, the steel plates used for the inner wall are made of carbon steel, which alone is strong enough. Each part will be welded together, both from inside and outside. Then the outer wall FRP forming process begins. We developed a rotating platform to perform the spray up method. This makes it possible to spray glass fiber and resin uniformly and seamlessly. The outer wall FRP is applied in several layers, and each layer is deformed and reinforced with resin in order to make the structure robust and safe. Tamada Kogyo is committed to meeting your needs and expectations with our reliable and solid technology and full support system. That's all for me. Thank you very much for your kind attention. Next, Mr. Kurihara of Nomibo Sai will give a presentation of automatic fire extinguish systems. Mr. Kurihara, please start. Hello, everybody. And my name is Kurihara, and I work in the overseas sales department of Nomi Side Overseas Business, especially in the Southeast Asia. And also, I am in charge of sales in South Asia. Um, my name is Yoshimitsu Sugiyama. Thank you very much for inviting me. Today, I will introduce the history and the network of Nomi Bosai, and later, I will introduce two products that have special features. These two products will protect people from fire ex uh, effectively, so please listen to the presentation until the end. Before I start my presentation, I'd like to explain the QR code on the screen. QR codes are always displayed on both sides of the screen. The pink QR code is for the company's website. The blue QR code on the other side will take you to the company's inquiry screen. If you have any questions, please scan the QR code and contact the company by email or phone. Here is the flow of today's presentation. First, I will explain Nomi Bosai's history vision, mission, and sales offices. After that, I will talk about our business. Finally, I will introduce two of our featured products. 
One in the, in the infrared eye, which is a highly sensitive flame detector, and the MIDEX-3, which effectively extinguishes flames with two types of form. First, I'd like to start our company. This man is Mr. Teru Zakanomi, Terumichi, and uh, uh, Nem Toriichi found Nomi Bosai in December 1916. In other words, the Nomi in Nomi Bosai refers to the name of the founder. And the disaster prevention is a Japanese word for fire prevention. And Nomi Bosai is a disaster prevention company served by Mr. Nomi. In 1923, there was a huge earthquake with a magnitude of 7.9 in a wide area around Tokyo. This earthquake occurred at 11.58 a time when many people were cooking inside their homes. Therefore, fires broke out in many buildings after the earthquake. Fires broke out in many buildings after the earthquake. And about 100,000 people died in the fire after the earthquake. And uh, the Teruichi Nomi, the founder of the company, witnessed this tragic situation. This disaster was a catalyst for his devotion to the study of fire prevention. And today, 106 years have passed since our founding, and we are protecting many people from fire as a pioneer in disaster prevention in Japan. Next, I'd like to talk about introduce a mission of Nomi Bosai. Nomi Bonsai has been contributing to the safety of society based on the sense of mission to protect life and property from fire. From now on, in order to meet the expectation and the demands of society, Nomi Bonsai will continue to protect people from fire and create safety and security for the people. The sales, overseas sales offices are located mainly in Asia, the Middle East, and Africa, with a total of 19 countries. In the countries where we have distributors, you can receive general support from the local people in addition to the support from Japan. Nomi Bosai is developing a wide range of businesses, um, as a comprehensive disaster prevention company, we cover not only manufacturing, but also research and development, equipment design, engineering, and maintenance. In addition, Nomi Bosa is well familiar with all aspects of fire prevention, detection, and extinguishing. Uh, the three divisions of automatic fire alarm system that detect fires, fire extinguish system, and that extinguish flames and post delivery maintenance account for 40%, 30%, and 20.5% of the total sales, respectively, and we provide extensive support in each division. Actually, you know, the wherever you live, Nomi products are everywhere in our daily lives, and Nomi Bosai products protect you from fire. Not only in buildings and houses, but also in factories, tunnels, ships, and other spaces where Nomi Bosai products protect people from fire in wide range. Among the main Nomi Bosai products today, I'd like to introduce the two products that have special features, one from our automatic fire alarm system detectors and one from our fire extinguishing systems. Before explaining the product, let's look at the different types of fire detectors. There are mainly three types of fire detectors, flame, smoke, and heat detectors. And the flame detectors work by detecting the flickering of ultraviolet or infrared lights emitted from 
flames. Smoke detectors work by detecting smoke, and heat detectors work by detecting heat. Next, we compare the speed at which the three types of detectors activate after a fire start. The horizontal axis shows the elapsed time, and the vertical axis shows the size of the flame. Of the three types of detectors, the flame detector has the fastest detection speed. Uh, the smoke detectors are activated when the smoke gradually builds up and reaches the detector. Finally, when the temperatures around the detector rises, the heat detector is activated. In other words, the flame detectors are the fastest of the detectors and the heat detectors take the longest time to detect a fire. This time, we will introduce the RR3 features of most sensitive of the flame detectors. Inflex I, and it quickly detects flames in large space and prevents fires or and small fires. Inflex I has a higher degree of sensitivity than conventional flame detectors. While conventional ones have a detection distance of about 15 meters, but the Inflex I has improved its performance by a factor of 4 in terms of detection distance and by a factor of 16 in terms of detection sensitivity. As you can see in this experiment, the Inflex I can capture the flame of a fire pan that is 33 centimeters square and placed at a distance of about 60 meters. So this is Inflex I. This is the IR3 Inflex I. It detects the flickering infrared light emitted from flames. It has high sensitivity and non-fire alarm performance, and it can be installed in direct sunlight or under artificial lighting, where it is easily mistaken for a flame. The Inflex I has two features. First, it can detect the flame of approximately 30 centimeter a square from a distance of 60 meters. It can also detect flames from a distance. Second, it detects the radiation and flickering characteristic of flames at three wavelengths, making it a high accurate product. And the Inflex I is easy to install and can be installed by a small number of people in a short period of time, making it easy to install even under Corona pandemic. The Inflex I, which detects fire quickly in large spaces, is mainly utilized in atriums and, and other large spaces, such as factories. So, what kind of fire extinguishing systems are available to put out flames? From the left, there are three types of fire extinguishing systems, water fire extinguishing systems which use water to lower the temperature and extinguish the flames, and foam fire extinguishing system, which use foam to cover the flames and lower the temperature and further suffocate the flame, and gas and power chemicals fire extinguishing system. Nomi Bosai is able to provide all types of equipment. Basically, the construction of fire extinguishing systems is a large undertaking in terms of time and cost. But today, we will introduce Midex 3, which is easy to install and can be easily operated by one person. I'd like to show you another video featuring this particular product. A mobile firefighting foam system that pursues firefighting performance and fire extinguishing capability. Effective firefighting is possible by switching between low expansion foam, which can extinguish a fire at a distance, and medium expansion foam, which has a strong extinguishing capability. As it is a package type device, it can be easily installed in existing facilities.
This is Midex 3, a packaged foam firefighting system. All the necessary equipment for fire extinguishing is stored in a box, making it easy to install. Here are the three features of Midex 3. First, effective firefighting. Quick and effective firefighting is possibly possible by switching between medium expansion foam, which has powerful firefighting capabilities, and low expansion foam, which can be emitted over a long distance. It is possible to extinguish a fire from a distance of about 20 meters, and the foam can be emitted from a distance of about 10 meters. Second, easy operation. Since the equipment is lightweight, it can be easily operated by one person. The hose can be pulled smoothly in any direction for firefighting. Third, easy operation. No plumbing, power supply, water source, pump, etc. are required because it is a packaged type and everything is contained in a box. Furthermore, Midex 3 is lightweight and compact so it can be installed anywhere. With the new coronavirus restricting construction work on site, Midex 3, which does not require any work in principle, has been receiving a large number of inquiries recently. This product can be installed in factories, hazardous material storage areas, packing, parking lots, and other areas where machine tools are handled. Lastly, if you have any questions or inquiries about our products, please jump to the blue QR code here. We are always open to questions and inquiries. Nomi Bosai has been a leading company in the disaster prevention industry in Japan for a long time and has been trusted by many people. We hope you will utilize Nomi Bosai in your areas as well. Thank you very much for your kind attention. Next presentation, measures against electric fire will be given by Mr. Ikuta and Mr. Ishihara of Hatsuta Seisakusho Corporation. Please start. Are you tired, everybody? But we are almost finished. Let's work hard. <laughs> First of all, I would like to remind you some of the points during the presentation. Now the presentation of Hatsuta Japan is about to start, and the presentation style will be a two-person conversation and uh, this presentation is participatory so that you are going to participate and you will see the questionnaire and i would like to ask you to answer to the questionnaire and today to the host is my name is seiyu ishihara and also we are joined by top runner masahiko ikuta now it's time of hot star gut trend this is today's this is a program where the top runner of the hottest trend talks to us and let us know more about the trend. Let's get started about today's topic. Today's trend is the trend of fire. Now I'm going to introduce today's top runner. Top runner is Mr. Ikuta of Hatsta. Hello, my name is Ikuta from Hatsta, Japan. Thank you for inviting me to GUT Trend. First, uh, about the Hatsuta Japan, I would like to introduce this company. Hatsuta Japan has a history of 119 years, and this is a dedicated company for fire prevention. And we have three major po products. First one is fire extinguishing for factory, vehicle, electric, appliances, we, 
we have manufacturing and selling 56 types. The second product is fire extinguishing history. Mainly, we are supplying them for factories and buildings. And third one is automatic fire extinguishing system. And this, can this machine can detect fire 24 hours. And also it can deal with difficult fire that are not specified in the Japanese uh, fire extinguishing law. Not only in Japan, we have subsidiaries and uh, distributors and agents in overseas countries, and I hope we have stationed also in your country. Hats to Japan is the first manufacturer that developed fire extinguishers. This is very old one. Have we ever seen such an old extinguisher? And also, we have a lot of various international certification and standards. So we are experts of fire extinction. Let's get back to the today's topic. Mr. that today's topic, is there any trend in fires? Yes, it is, although the trend varies by time and country. And in East Asia today, one of the top three causes is electric fire. So the topic of today is electrical fires. And uh, let's talk about it. God's trend. Uh, there are four major causes of electric fires. First one was a leakage fire, the ele electricity current leaks. Second one is connection failure because cables are not connected properly. Third one is tracking. Then the fire occurs from the outlet. The first, fourth one is a short circuit. The wires connected, bare wires connected. Now it's time we have been, you. This is the time for a questionnaire. And this is the time you are going to use the smartphone. Please read this QR code and you will read one question. The question is, what electrical fire is the most common electric fire in your country? Question is, what electrical fire is the most common in your country? Please answer this question. Leakage fire, tracking fire, connection fire, or short circuit? There are four answers. How, how is it? Thank you very much for your cooperation. We got the result and uh, I need, uh, maybe we need to w wait a little more because we are receiving answers, still receiving. Yes, we got the result. Leakage, 20%. Tracking fire, 10%. Short circuit, 58%. Connection failure, 9%. And the 34 answered, thank you very much. Thank you very much, although you are very tired now. And so the causes, there are four major causes. Mr. Ikuta, what is the countermeasure? For instance, what should we do against the electrical leakage? And this is how it occurs. Once the cover is broken and, and the electric current leaks from the cable and the, the stuff nearby gets burned, and finally the total factory will be burned. Next, I would like to explain the measures. First, cable stripped. Put electrical wires in conduit or tube to protect them, or carry out wiring coating inspection. Second, you, you need to install the earth, earth leakage breaker that shuts down by detecting earth leakage. Or you can install a leakage alarm 
that arises when an electric leak occurs. Uh, ele electricity isn't shut off. The third one is the fire is the, do not place materials or substance near the wiring or, or install a pure water fire extinguisher. Pure water fire extinguisher is a liquid type special extinguisher. This can be connected to the live uh, connector or cable. Please look at the photo on the right. The right one is a general type one. This causes short circuit. However, on the left photo, if you use pure water type, no short circuit. As you can see, the countermeasures differ depending on the stage. However, there are a few companies that are able to take such measures. Well, that was surprising. It seems that everyone can do. I wonder why this is. Why they do not do that? I think it's because we don't know where electrical fires are looking. So is there any good way to do this? Actually, my child is working in a factory overseas, and I'm worried about my child got injured by a fire accident. Hatsta is here to solve your problems. We all have a service called a fire risk assessment. Can you tell me about that fire risk assessment? Yes, this service is not just specific to electrical fires. It's a service to visualize and assess all kinds of risks. Can you tell me a little bit more in detail? Yes, Hatsta, the experts, look at the factory, and we have 20, 256 checking items, for instance, electrical uh, fire, leakage, short sucking, tracking. We have so uh, tracking items. After seeing the factory, actually, the report will be made. And as for this uh, report, uh, this is a case of the high potential of the tracking fire. And actually, there is a kind of control panel which may have the connection problems. And therefore, it is proposing to use a fire extinguisher equipment. And actually, this is um, automatic detection trees. And for instance, a carbon dioxide extinguisher gas causes the least amount of the falling after extinguish minimizing damage to control tanks. And here is the detection of both smoke and gas combustibles, which one is very good. And we can make a proposal to reduce the risk of a fire in the company from both hardware and software aspect. This service can also be used in the company where your child works. Of course, at your uh, factories who you are listening, thank you very much. I'll contact my child after this program, by the way, what should I do if I want you to provide a service you mentioned? There is a better way. Since we are invited to be on the program today, we'd like to ask you to scan the QR code that we are going to show you, and you will contact us. And as for the product that today we introduce are uh, these items, pure water, extinguisher, and cabin X, and and the uh, sensor to check, detect the gas and the smoke and the leakage alarm, leakage breaker, and fire risk assessment. And you can ask through this QR code. And if you want to know the detail of the each items, everything is possible for you. If you can not, don't know how to read the QR code, are there anybody who don't know? Let me explain how to do it. I will explain how to make it. Actually, I'd like to hear more, but it seems, you know, we're running up time. And uh, today's topic, the trend is fire, electric fires. But Hatsashipan is a company that is taking this issue seriously and the, the producing result for various kind of fires. And uh, see you in the next hot got trend. Next time, we'll be looking at trends of curry. See you next time. Thank you very much for everything.
はいありがとうございました続きまして最後のセッションになりますウィルコンティニュー・ウィズ・ラスト・セッション。カモト・オブ・ホーチ・コーポレーション・ウィル・ギブ・アス・プレゼンテーション・オン・オートマティック・ファイア・アラーム・システム。プレイズ・スタート。そう、私は岡本、オーバー・オーバー・セールス・セールス・セクション。Thank you very much. My name is Imamoto. Thank you very much. So, I'd like to show you a video first. The facilities that we use every day, including stations, office buildings, schools, and houses, are always equipped with devices and equipment for detecting heat or smoke, notifying people of fires, and putting out any fires that are found. As a leading company in disaster prevention systems centered on fire alarm systems, Hochki Corporation provides safety and security in the daily lives of people not only in Japan, but throughout the world. Hochki's business is currently centered on the prevention of fire disasters, while providing comprehensive solutions to realize greater safety and security. Hochki's strength lies in R&D, manufacturing, sales, designing and installing, maintenance, upgrading, consulting, and providing an integrated system. This enables the installation of optimal products and systems at all times in buildings and facilities, and allows the setting up of a reliable system that will function properly in the event of an emergency. Hochki has development centers and plants both domestically and internationally, as well as one of the largest multi purpose fire test laboratories in the world, located in Miyagi Prefecture. This huge facility is used to carry out demonstration tests on water cannons and other major fire extinguishing experiments. Hochki also provides security systems centered on managing the entering and exiting of people to and from buildings, contributing to the establishment of greater safety and security in society. In addition, we also participated in disaster prevention activities in the Shinagawa area, where our head office is located, implemented a project to restore coastal forests, and provided support to restoration work after the Great East Japan earthquake. Engaging actively in initiatives to protect local communities and the world. In 2018, we celebrated our 100th anniversary at Hochki. To evolve from a Japanese manufacturer of disaster prevention goods to a global brand, we have been engaging actively and strategically in our expansion overseas. Hochki first began exporting products overseas as early as 1961. Then, 10 years later, in 1971, the company established a local subsidiary in Los Angeles as the first step toward full scale globalization. And today, they are being used in London's underground. Famous hotels and sports facilities, museums, Castles and numerous other buildings and facilities in cities throughout the world. Boasting complete reliability, Hochki Corporation will continue expanding the circle of safety to people throughout the world. Okay, please show us our slides. 
Next, I'd like to talk about our wireless technology. First, I'd like to introduce our wireless network type residential fire alarms. In conventional standalone residential fire alarms, only the detector in the room where the fire is detected will ring. On the other hand, this wireless network type alarm enables not only the detector in the room where the fire is detected, but also the detectors installed in other rooms to issue an alarm. This enables early fire detection and early evacuation. This residential alarm has a 10-year operating life. That is, it can protect the safety and security of people in their residences for 10 years. Now, I'd like to explain the features of this wireless network type residential fire alarm. Please take a look at number two, general methods. A general wireless system consists of a master unit and slave units and communication between the slave units is done via the master unit. This method has some limitations. For example, it does not work without the master unit, and the master unit must be installed at the center of all slave detectors in order to ensure the reliability of wireless communication. Next, please take a look at number one, Hochiki, on the left-hand side of the slide. Hochiki products use our proprietary intercommunication system, so there is no distinction between master and slave detectors. At the time of installation, initial settings can be made from any of the detectors, and there are also no particular restrictions on the installation locations. In addition, all detectors are equipped with a repeater function to ensure reliable wireless communication. So how we have introduced wireless residential alarm systems for residential use. Next, we will introduce the ECHO, a wireless automatic fire alarm system that can be installed in buildings where it is difficult to install wiring, such as historical buildings. This ECHO utilizes the latest MESH net technology build a highly reliable equipment while minimizing the impact on the surrounding environment. Conventional wireless devices require prior registration between the devices to be connected, that is, detectors, amplifiers, and repeater in order to communicate information. However, the ecosystem automatically selects the strongest signal path and communicates with amplifiers and repeaters to build a wireless network. This enables more reliable information communication depending on the installation environment. Furthermore, by connecting the wireless repeater with wire, it is possible to build a single system that has both wireless and wired equipment. Thank you. These are the introduction of our company and our wireless technology. Contact information can be found on the corporate website of Hochi Corporation. Please do a search for Hochiki. Thank you very much for watching the presentation. Now we have concluded all the sessions. In the program sent to you in advance, we, you will find an email address where you can ask questions about this international forum. If you have any questions, please send them to the address. We apologize, but we will only accept questions in English. And we are also planning to archive the forum on YouTube for a certain period of the time. When it is ready, we will send an announcement to the email address you provided when you registered. Please make use of it to review the various presentations that were provided today. This concludes the International Forum on Fire and Disaster Management. Take care, everyone. I will see you again. Thank you very much for your participation. Bye-bye, everybody.